Good morning, Ken Bates reporting in. Good morning. Uh, it is nine o'clock. I think people are starting to, well, we're getting a bunch of people logging in now. Um, I'll, I'll def defer to Jonathan about when we wanna get started. Um, yeah, let's give it, um, yeah, mor morning everyone. Morning, Ken, morning, Kit, hi. Um, yeah, we're, we're seeing some people uh, log in now. So uh, let's give it, what were we, nine o'clock. Let's give it uh, three or four minutes and, um, and we'll get going from there. Okay, everyone. Let's uh, let's get going. Good morning to you. Hope that uh, you had a uh, a restful evening after a good few hours on Zoom yesterday, and um, we'll uh, we'll do the same again today. 
and uh, I, I enjoyed the conversations. I think there were a lot of uh, very, very good points made. And uh, thanks again for all of you for your contributions and for the facilitators and particularly for the note takers. Um, Kit, also, thanks very much for sending out the notes of yesterday. Um, you should have got, everyone should have got that in their emails. If um, and you'll find it useful, I'm sure, to kind of refer back to some of that today as we build on the conversations of yesterday and um, and take them a little bit further. So, as you can probably see on the screen that's being shared there, uh, we've got our agenda up for the day. Just a reminder: so what we did yesterday was we uh, we spent some time. All of you had looked at the scenarios in advance. We spent some time thinking about what these might mean for Northern California and um, and fishing in Northern California. And then in the afternoon, we split up into three stakeholder groups, really thinking about the you know the particular challenges and opportunities of each of those situations. Um, what we're going to do today is keep in mind those challenges and opportunities, but move the conversation much more towards okay, if this is what we're facing. What can we do about it? How do we prepare for a world like Blue Revolution? Or how do we prepare for a world like Hollowed Out? Um, what is it that we can do to either prevent the worst things happening or to make sure that we're doing things to cope? And so today, and particularly this morning, is all about generating ideas for what we can do to help prepare our communities, our harvesters, our managers, all of us, how can we prepare more effectively for the future? So it's all about generating those action ideas. Um, after going through that in the morning, we'll then spend a bit of time in the afternoon where instead of going through scenario by scenario, we'll look across the whole range of actions that we've identified and said, What's rising to the top? Now, we already had a bit of a conversation about that yesterday afternoon, about some of the common themes. We'll do more of that um, this afternoon, really thinking about how we want to prioritize actions um, across different groups. And for that, we might mix it up a little bit so that instead of the three groups, we might add another group thinking about scientists and researchers who are distributed amongst the groups right now, but we might do a specific group on science and research. Um, as you can see from that, we'll then be kind of pulling it all together with some reflections and next steps, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up by 4.30, but effectively the same timing as we did yesterday. Okay, um, so with that, I think what I'll do, Kit, if I can, uh, if I can request a share screen here. Thank you. Um, this is the agenda that's effectively the equivalent agenda that, um, that that kid has put up there and maybe the first thing i wanted to to do and this is always very useful i think in in you know scenario workshops particularly we did a lot of work yesterday. You spent a lot of time generating, generating ideas. We were tired by about 4.30. Uh, we had a few ideas kind of coming up about what was, what was interesting and important. Um, but I, I just wondered whether anyone has reflected or think, okay, here's, here's a theme or here's something that I heard yesterday that I'm kind of particularly intrigued by. And I would like to make sure that we discuss or talk about this today. Um, and and this, this kind of overnight thoughts in some ways is, I think it's, it's nicely kind of inspired by a great Northern California writer, John Steinbeck, you know, a problem difficult at night. If you can't create, kind of wrestle with it, it's often solved in the morning once the committee of sleep has worked on it. So this kind of great idea of, uh, of the mind kind of doing its uh, unconscious sort of uh, work overnight and then thinking, oh, you know, there's, there's something that kind of either bugged me or something that struck me yesterday that I'd like to think about a little bit more. So uh, let's give ourselves just a few minutes before we get into our groups to, uh, to think about the, the overnight reflections and wondered whether there was anything that, that people wanted to, to share or uh, reflect on um, as we thought about the conversations of yesterday and the hopes for the for the conversation today. So I'll uh, I'll stop sharing that and um, have the participant list up. And uh, same deal as yesterday. Um, if uh, if anyone wants to comment on anything that uh, that emerged from yesterday, or even a, a request or a hope for some of the things that you think are going to be relevant for us to cut, to to cover off today, um, 
good time to speak up. Yes, Ken, let's go over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Ken Bates, Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association. Um, I I don't know if, if this is the right time for, for this particular comment. It's probably you know, maybe three or four minutes worth if you want to hear it now. But my concern is looking at the stuff that we did yesterday and thinking about it, I'm thinking about uh, uh, management flexibility and if and if you think this is a good time to go into that for a minute we can do it and if not i can hold my comments till this afternoon um no ken yes, let's uh, please yeah yeah <clears throat> that, thanks yvonne i was going to say the same yeah please go ahead ken. Uh, uh, okay I, i'm quite concerned i'm quite concerned about about the possibility of how do you arrange management management flexibility who is ultimately responsible for management flexibility. And I'm gonna just run through some, some recent real-time um, real uh, experiences that I have had. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I petitioned the PFMC about four years ago to amend the sardine fisheries management plan to allow for a de minimis fisheries provision to accommodate less than one ton landings for artisanal fishermen. Um, the PFMC, as you guys know way better than I do, is a huge, huge churning organization full of gears and cogs and wheels. We were able to accomplish that in about a year and a half, and it got approved by uh, the Department of Congress and all that stuff, and eventually that provision was included in the FMP. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, in California in 1998, we went ahead and we got uh, the Marine Life Management Act was approved by the legislature, handed to the commission and to the department for basically to, to revolutionize how we managed fisheries. In 2018, the, the commission finally had a draft implementation plan, you know, to, 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 to start to actually implement that. In the meantime, before that was actually the plan was even drafted and got that far, Fishermen in Northern California had submitted four proposals to try to reverse the removal of the de minimis fishery provision in the market squid FMP. The first, the first shot at that started in 2014. Now, the four proposals that were put in, one was withdrawn and three were denied at the commission level. One was a 60 page long proposal. Um, after that, three fishermen's associations put in a collaborative fisheries research project between the associations and the department to look at squid through fisheries driven research that was denied. Um, for myself, I've served on the director's herring advisory committee for the, for the limited entry fisheries since the mid 1970s when it was formed. I spent three years trying to include an option for alternative fishing gear in the herring fisheries management plan uh, that didn't make it into the plan. In 2009, in 2019, I put in a proposal for small-scale fishing lumpar gear to take herring by permitted fishermen within the, the um, <clears throat> during the regular and herring and excuse me herring gillnet season. That was denied. Uh, this year, I, in 2020, I have put in a request to amend, amend the Title 14 code to allow the take of herring with lumpar bait nets. The lumpar bait net is is a small-scale fishing gear. It's a round hull gear. It has no purse rings or anything on the bottom. And the difference between a regular Lumpara net and a Lumpara bait net is, in a, according to the Fish and Game Code, is merely that a Lumpara bait net has number nine twine or smaller in the wing panels. Um, that has not gone any further. And in fact, commission staff actually, actually reached out to enforcement to see, to make it, to see if it was illegal for me to catch food grade fish in Lumpara bait gear and with the idea that maybe I could only sell it for bait. So I look at all these things and my concern, my huge concern is that is that you know is that fishermen and managers on an individual basis, nobody is going to have the horsepower to get through the bureaucracy of these of uh, of these management proposals to make changes in, in a in a in a responsible and meaningful time period. So that's my comment. I hope we can think about that thing today as we go through. Thank you.
Okay, Kent, th thanks very much for that. And no, I re really appreciate you set setting that out. And, you know, it was one of the things that was that, that I was thinking about overnight as I think it was John had mentioned about the importance of kind of flexibility and the importance of collaboration. And one of the big questions in my mind was, you know, what 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 exactly does that mean? How do we see that um, kind of uh, kind of play out? And uh, and you, you've explained part of that there in terms of, you know, we can talk about flexibility, but what does it mean, and how do we ensure that it starts to uh, that it starts to happen? Um, so Ken, thanks thanks for raising that. Um, I wonder if anyone either wants to. Uh, you know, kind of build on that, or also in, in some ways, I think it is very much kind of front and center of what we're trying to do here to, to, to build up the sense in which, given that climate change is happening, given there is so much uncertainty around it, we know flexibility is so important. So it is very much front and center of the, the I think, the plans that'll come out of this. Um, uh, let's go to Steve. Why don't you come on on this? Steve, are you there? Steve, you, I'm, 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 I'm seeing your hand up, but I'm seeing you on mute. Can, it, can anyone, uh, uh, have we lost the audio on this? We can hear you, Jonathan, we just can't hear Steve. Oh, there, he's unmuted now. Okay. Um, Hey, Steve, before you go, I've also had a note, um, and Chris, this might be something you want to think about. Um, I've had a note from Stephanie Webb um, saying that, that there's, there may be an audio issue for some folks. So um, I'll see whether um, I'll, I'll respond to Stephanie or, or Chris, you may want to respond to Stephanie on that. Steve. Okay. Are you ready to back in? Yes. Yeah, Steve, you're on. Thank you. Yeah, this, this thought may be a little bit unformed, but I guess I wonder if uh, there should be a category in, in the scenarios um, that is something around um, mitigations that, that may be suggested or even enacted that by, you know, in regard to try to minimize climate change, but by themselves, might have you know significant impacts on fisheries, and of course we talked about the offshore wind one as, as one example. But you know another example is uh, you know the movement to to create thirty percent uh, protected areas along the coast and even through uh, federal waters, and and so you know what would what would those seeming mitigations you know and in in that case it was for biodiversity, but those mitigations do and, and what kind of challenge were they themselves create for fisheries? trying to manage their way through climate change. Right. Yep. So, um, yeah, as you say, Steve, there, there are, um, there are going to be lots of different organizations and, um, uh, that, that are going to be looking at how they can, uh, protect or how they can deal with climate change in their own ways. And, it's, it's not only the, the fishing community, but others, and then the fishing community gets affected by those. Okay. Any other um, any other thoughts from folks just on you know, kind of generally observations from our conversations yesterday? Things to make sure we bear in mind today. Um, obviously, we will talk a lot about the the flexibility issue, and I think that that's something that I'd, I'd encourage all the small groups to to think about in you know a good amount of detail as um, as Ken has kind of invited us to do, and I'm sure we'll come back to it later. Um, so definitely covering that one off. Uh, anything else that, uh, that that struck people for now? Okay. So I think, oh, Deb, go ahead, yes. Well, I was just gonna say, um, I was looking through the notes this morning from yesterday and um, I came across a couple that to me are, uh, they're, the way I was thinking about it, they were somewhat in conflict and I was having 
a little bit of a challenge in resolving how you address them in a way that moves forward and um, provides a pos more positive outcome. And that was, there was a statement that related to, um, had to do with uh, influx and egress of both uh, fishermen out of the fleet due to lack of infrastructure or lack of their species of preference or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and that impacting port infrastructure, but then the flip side being that when newer species came in and boats from other areas came in, that now you didn't have the port infrastructure that you might need to be able to support that influx. So I, w I, I was just looking and seeing that as a challenge that obviously port infrastructure is a huge, huge thing to try and address. So yeah. <laughs> how do you do it when on the one hand you're losing it because of this um, egress or loss of fleet? But on the other hand, needing it, so it 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 just I mean it's probably more obvious to everybody else, but that was one that really struck me as yeah. how how to address that as a challenge. Yeah, and it 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 it's, it speaks I think a lot to this this question of um, it, it's a great point, Devin. It speaks a lot to this question of how do you manage transitions in all of this? And I think there was there was a lot of conversation yesterday around you know how how do we provide support for infrastructure um, if the if, if the existing you know, kind of way in which that is supported isn't sufficient to, to uh, when 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 you do get the egress um, then then how do we kind of come across that so it is I think a, you know a, a big a big challenge of kind of transitioning towards you know a, a, a kind of new, a new not not a new normal but just transitioning towards a much more a much more kind of dam dynamic environment and infrastructure given given its you know, it, it's nature, it's fixed, it's there, it has to be there for a long time. Um, it's, it's tough thinking about that in a very kind of flexible, dynamic manner. All right. So with that, I'm going to, um, Kit, shall we, do you want to put back up the, the, the breakout groups from yesterday. And I don't know whether, Chris, this is something that um, uh, you've been looking at and we can kind of just, given who we've got today, you know, is there any reallocation needed and so on? Um, Kit, maybe over to you just to remind people which groups they were in and how we're going to allocate folks. Sure. Um, hold on a sec. I'll share my screen here. I've been, I took uh, yesterday's um, groups and sort of on the fly made some adjustments. Um, and uh, so here's what I've got. Uh, so, um, pretty much the same group, some, the, some people uh, were unable to come today and maybe some people who had to bow out yesterday. I think I've got everybody that's on assigned, if not, speak up. Um, and uh, I guess, Deb, I, <laughs> I hope you don't mind to balance out the groups. I, sort of a utility player, I moved you from the harvester group to the community group. Um, That's so, totally fine. Uh, and um, Chris, uh, I guess if, he, so Chris is the, man behind the curtain who actually sets up the breakout group. So I'm just checking with him to see if um, this these lists are accurate and he's been able to uh, set the, the groups up accordingly. Okay, that's Chris. I'm filling them in right now. Okay. Well, why don't we just give you a minute? Obviously, we can't do anything until you've done your thing and if you, if you, as you work through what we have up on the screen, if there's either, uh, you know, somebody who's not here on the list or, or there are people that uh, are here that aren't on the list, just speak up.
Um, I'll take the opportunity then just to just to remind people what the what the task is here when we go into our groups, and um, we'll, we'll run this until um, probably around uh, eleven o'clock. So take a break in the morning at some point in the in the groups, but uh, but let's say we'll run this for for about an hour and a half. Um, so your your task is you're you're back in these three stakeholder groups. Um, you've, you're aware of the challenges and opportunities because you identified them yesterday. Um, effectively, your job is to say, well, okay, well, if we find ourselves in fortune and favor, if we imagine that fortune and favor is going to happen, what is it that we as managers or as harvesters or as communities, what really should we do? What action should we start to take now? To, to, to prepare for that particular world. What is it that we need to do? Because we don't want to be surprised by it. Um, it's something that um, if we know it's going to happen, then what can we do now to make sure we're in a better position for when this kind of scenario plays out? So that's really the kind of the nature of the conversation. And um, uh, depending on, you know, try and be as kind of specific as possible um, with, with with all of this, um, obviously we know some of the overall themes that are going to come out, but let's uh, let's see how much we can kind of be specific in terms of imagining what we could do to try and prepare better for these futures. All right, I'm just double checking my work. It looks like we are good to go. I can always move people around once we open the rooms uh, if there's any mistakes. Okay, Chris. Well, um, Jonathan, well, let yeah. Chris press the magic button and unless yeah. you have any, anything more. Nope, all good. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kit. Hey, Chris, are you there in the uh, in the main room? Yes, I am. All right. Um, I'm looking at the participants here, and is there's there's some alignment with with the the spreadsheet that you had, but not total. I think so. I'm seeing so Katie, Brianna, Stephanie are in here, um, which is great. Um, uh, looks like Steve Steve is on. This one, I don't know whether Steve um, Chaibla was due to be somewhere else. And then um, Irene, you're in here, which is which is great. And then I think we would do, Jan Roledo was in this group as well, uh, Chris, and I don't know whether she's... Um, uh, yeah, she accidentally got moved. I was just looking at her. Okay. However, it's not letting me unassign her. I might have to message her and ask her to come back to the main session because it's not allowing me to assign her here because this is an unassigned space. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So I've got. Yeah, and then I've also I've got a note from Irene, um, Chris. So I think Irene's due to be in the community group. All right. There she is. All right, she should be in communities now. Okay. Sorry, my uh, Google Sheet didn't refresh, so I started building it off of yesterday's data. Got it. And then halfway through it, all of a sudden refreshed, the whole page changed. So my, my apologies for that. That's okay. We'll see whether, uh, see whether Jan comes back.
into uh, in, in, into this one from uh, from yesterday. All right. Um, okay. So with that, um, Travis, if if I could ask you, please, to uh, share your screen with the worksheet of uh, of this one. Great. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, that's just great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So we have, um, let's just check. So do we have, so um, Brianna, Katie, Stephanie, Steve, um, they're the ones I've got on the list as well as um, myself and Travis. Um, can I just get a, either a, a hand up or a yes from just to check that you're, you're online with us here. Brianna, thanks. Hi, good morning. This is Katie. Hey, Katie. Good morning. Stephanie, great. Um, not sure about Steve. Good morning. Hey, Stephanie. All right. All right. Well, let's, we'll, um, we'll get going with our, uh, with our select group. And, and, and Travis, thanks Travis, again for thanks taking, notes. taking notes. And if there's... And um, if there's uh, oh, I'm getting an echo. Let's plow through on this. Stephanie, if you can mute your end, that should kill the echo, I believe. Okay. All good. Um, all right, everyone. So our, our task now, you know, can kind of set it up for us. So in some ways, you know, we're, we're, we're now the, the managers group or thinking about fishery management. And our task now is to say, well, you know, what, what actions would, would you, ideally kind of could or should or want want to take um to have to deal with the scenarios that we're that, that we're kind of looking at here so the the way in which we'll do this is we'll go through scenario by scenario um and the maybe the best way to think about this is so let's let's put fortune in favor in our in our minds at the moment so so let's let's just think forget about hollowed out or box of chocolates or blue revolution Fortune and favor is the scenario that is going to happen. Okay, we just we just have it on full authority that that's the one that's going to play out over the next twenty years. Um, if fishery managers knew that to be the case, what changes or what what actions do you think fishery managers could or should do? to prepare for fortune and favor. Maybe, maybe you're thinking, hey, you know, we're all, we're all set up. There's really not many changes needed. I don't know about that. But that's the, that's the question we've got in our minds. You know, if we're going into a world where the climate is changing, ocean conditions are changing, you know, in a relatively kind of gradual fashion, um, stock availability is pretty good. Um, things are moving much more towards a kind of domestic local approach. Um, all of those things in fortune and favor. If we know all those things and we think about the challenges and opportunities, um, what is it that uh, we should be thinking about doing as fishery managers? Hey there, Jonathan. It's Brianna. Um, I go back to how this one's preparing us for a shift of species to the north. And um, I think, you know, that that's directly related to what Ken had to say this morning. Um, and so it's it's going back to the whole concept of communities and allowing for management to have the flexibility for fishermen to be able to fish in their backyard when a species shows up. So I don't know how to give you, Travis, a succinct way to put that down, but I mean, the concept is 
communities fishing in their backyard, essentially. Yeah, thanks for that, Brianna. Um, this is Travis. Um, I was thinking along those same lines um, that management could do everything in its power to um, try to reduce hurdles to um, regulatory changes, um, which kind of lends to that same idea of flexibility. Yeah. Um Brianna, sorry, I, I was asking you a question. I was on mute. I didn't realize um, uh, the, when, when you when you this con this kind of concept of and, and it'd be good to Travis. It'd be good to kind of to capture this this idea of um, uh, you know communities fishing in their own backyard. Um, I, I'm I'm intrigued, Brianna, Brianna, just in terms of so is is that if that's something we're aspiring to. Um, What's what's preventing that today? I guess it depends on which species folks are interested right. in fishing and whether or not they have the proper permits in place or they have the gear. Um, so I mean, it's yeah. the management perspective of rules and regulations that are in place and also whether or not the port is prepared to receive that sort of fish that shows up. Right. Yeah. So it, 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 it sounds as if we're, you're describing or we're describing a kind of a, a, a current set of management arrangements and a current, a current system that is you know, kind of reasonably well designed for uh, a static world where, where, where we know where fish are, we know, you know it's predictable as to where the fishing grounds are and the, the permits are allowed in particular places. Um, and effectively, we're, we're describing a situation where if, if that unpredictability gets um, much greater, then the the system and the management arrangements um as currently constituted are just you know that they're they're not going to work to the kind of the, the the benefit of fishermen is that is that a kind of fair assessment saying look no matter what happens any changes are going to put pressure on the kind of management arrangements yeah um, i'm also seeing this message from steve saying where he should be i welcome steve to be here um yeah just I'm working with Steve in the chat right now. Okay. Okay. I'd hate to see him go because I, I I would like his perspectives um on the work he's done for the Monterey Harbor and the different plans that he's um, written and put together and mm -hmm. you know this whole concept of how to cater or work with a port to to think about these things. Yeah. Steve, are you with us? I'm still with you. I think Chris is trying to get rid of the community. So, Steve, it, it looks like you're signed in twice, which would also explain why we're getting that really uh, loud feedback when you unmuted your mic. So I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to try to remove one of your instances. If it kicks you out of the meeting completely, please rejoin. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I've removed one of the instances. Can you try unmuting your mic now? How's this? Much better. Fantastic. Yeah, for some reason, the, the meeting dropped me and I had to rejoin. So evidently, I rejoined twice as it ended up. Okay. So would you like me to leave Steve here or try to move him over to community? Steve, stay with us for a little while. And then uh, if you want to go, 
do that. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll second Brianna's request, at least at, at, at the moment, Steve, if it's okay, just to stay with us for a few minutes, just to, uh, just to chat about, um, you know, this question of kind of port flexibility in a world where, where we've got rain shifts. Sure. Um, and Stephanie, I see your hand is up, so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, so, so Steve, why, why don't you think about things? Stephanie, let's go to you and then I'll ask maybe Brianna to kind of, to post a, you know, kind of pause it a question to Steve. So let's go to Stephanie first and then, um, and then we'll come back Steve to you in a moment. Stephanie. Yeah, thanks. I was kind of thinking about what Brianna had mentioned about, you know, she mentioned two components, right? Gear, having the gear and then write the permit. And I think it's um, together, they kind of pose different obstacles, but they're not mutually exclusive. And so there's ways I think that could be addressed uh, differently, right? So there's one, the ability to either transfer the location or the person of the permit. But then there's also this restriction around gear type, right? Certain species are only allowed to be caught with certain gear. Mm -hmm. So maybe even if there was an opportunity to transfer the, per the permit to person or location, maybe that person doesn't have the gear type, right? So you're not going to have a fisherman who then can invest a whole, in, invest in a whole new system of gear to target now this new fish. Right. So, yeah. so I think that it, that could still, even if there was a lot of work being done around being able to, to do those transfers efficiently and effectively with minimal financial resources to the fishermen and to the managers, then we still have this gear hurdle. And, and that's going to, and so there might be a way also to try to think about, um, like, uh, portfolio fishing and, or what species can be caught with more than one gear type what does that look like are there fisheries that could have more flexible gear options and what are those gear options and what what are gears that can catch more than one species and how do we think about this in a very different way from just kind of these single species permit and gear type and, and start thinking about what does these changes start looking like great Thanks, Stephanie. No, really appreciate that. And um, uh, as you say, it, it, it's um, you know the, the, the kind of the distinction there between the permits and the gear, and and they may they might mean or might need sort of different, different sort of slightly different management approaches. Um, really good points. So, Brianna, let's let's go back to you and uh, and and ask ask Steve the or almost uh, the the question that you you posed to him earlier. Thanks. Um, so, Steve. Correct me. I, I believe that there's a Monterey port um, plan or vision that you may have worked on. And I was just wondering if you could highlight some of the key points, if anything sticks out um, that addresses the, the topic yeah. we're on right now. Yeah, you, you bet. Um, well, this, this can get very complicated, but, you know, the setting of Monterey is that, is that the culture uh, and history of fishing is still very important in that relatively small community. And so, you know, what, what allowed from that is my, you know, addressing the city council and asking them to commit to accepting grant funding and staff time to create a, a community sustainability plan uh, for fisheries. In other words, uh, a statement as, as to the status of things now, but also Visioning what's needed to preserve and and actually enhance or grow grow fisheries, and so uh, the the city did commit to that, and we we hired a contractor uh, to help with that, um, and we ended up with a plan that that did have uh, about half of it set <coughs> set forth uh, the status of landings and values and and some relationships, uh, but the other half of it was about thirty five recommendations. Uh, for you know, preserving and enhancing fisheries, and among those are things as simple as you know you you got to improve the ice, the ice service you know hugely. We need another public hoist, uh, traffic flow for the large eighteen wheel trucks on the wharf there are you know it's terrible. We got to figure that out. Um, but a really key one was involved involved the groundfish fishery, 
that there was a real worry that the groundfish fishery was going to leave in the new transferability uh, you know, uh, pieces of the ITQ program. It could leave Monterey Bay and be transferred, sold, or what have you to the, to the Northwest, and we would be without that. And groundfish was really quite a uh, historic and important fishery, both in Moss Landing and Monterey for, for many years. And so uh, with that concern, uh, there was a further concern or a recommendation to create a, some kind of a nonprofit that could acquire um, groundfish quota, quota shares, and then actively uh, manage it in a leasing method uh, to lo local people with uh, incentives uh, for both conservation and uh, you know, actually landing in Monterey and what have you. And, and that actually grew. I mean, we did create the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust from that. But from there, the city of Monterey actually um, committed to being a, a quota share owner and committed um, almost a million dollars to buy quota, quota shares and then have the Fisheries Trust manage it. So, you know, that, that is a form of management. It's just leasing. It's not ownership um, for the fishermen themselves. Uh, but it's pretty historic. As far as I know, uh, the city of Monterey was the only entity in the country, really, as a public agency that owns quota share. Could be wrong about that, but it's the only one I know of. Thanks, Steve, for that. Um, Brianna, does that, um, it, does you know, Steve's approach there and what was going on in Monterey, does, does that speak, you know, it, it, it's interesting as to, you know, the kind of the, the threat of the movement of the of the groundfish fishing to to another uh, another area, and they were able to kind of deal with it in that way. Does that speak very much to the to the question of um, you know trying to deal with the the dynamics and trying to trying to ensure that fisheries survive in an era of, of flexibility? I think broadly, it's an excellent example and something to really think about and consider. Um, I mean, the question that pops up to me are the more, you know, detailed questions of, is it, you know, are the leasing fees reasonable? And are they something that um, folks can live with or is it still a limiting factor and only certain um, people can get into the system? But we don't, we don't need to talk about that here. Um, but, you know, just the whole cost structure and how, how that works and, and to make it so um, more people can afford to get in and get their, their foothold um, to do it. I, I would add that I, I don't actually view uh, the trust having, or the city for that matter, owning the quota shares and leasing it as, a, as ultimately being a good thing because it is just leasing. <laughs> And, and it's, it's not an ownership right that would really, you know, uh, theoretically lock the fisheries into the region or the community. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, the, the entity, the trust or the city has to be sort of fair about it. So they may need to, <clears throat> to lease to one person for a couple of years and then, and then provide another opportunity to somebody else for a few years. But that means removing <laughs> the opportunity from the other folks. So it's not a perfect system. But as a sort of a Band-Aid on, on the catch here thing, I think it was a, a good thing. No, great, thank you. Let's, um, let's see if there's a, a few other things kind of coming up in, in fortune and favor here. Obviously, we've got the, we've got the rain shifts as a, as, a, as a key element, and that's gonna happen in no, no matter which scenario. So it's, it, it's, it's gonna end up as a kind of, a, as a robust option. We also talked in, in this world about, um, actually, let, let's just kind of think about the opportunity there. We talked in this world about there being, in some ways, kind of more players in the game. You've still got the kind of the survival of, of small scale fisheries, more interest in being involved and invested in the future of kind of sustainable fishing. Is there, um, is there anything from a, from a management point of view that would, um, do you think, yeah, if, if, if we were to do the following, we'd encourage that to happen, or, you know, here's a way in which management could take advantage of, of the fact that there were, 
um, there was still this sort of energy and interest in fisheries. Does does there anything else? Does anything else kind of strike you in a, in a world like Fortune and Favor? Sure, we we know we need to, to kind of build in more flexibility as as stocks shift around. Is there anything else from a management point of view that you'd say here's a good way to take advantage of the conditions we see in Fortune and Favor? Yeah, I think um, just coming back to the the consumer and, um, you know, it, it's pretty apparent in the pandemic right now that um, there's really this strong local interest in seafood and, um, you know, kind of knowing, knowing your fishermen and knowing where your seafood is coming from and getting, um, you know, to to drive up to a location in your community and grab fish that was caught in your community. And um, I think this scenario is a a good opportunity to build on that. And, um, you know, a a big part of that for managers might be just continuing to keep um, the public in the conversation and continuing to find really creative and engaging ways to, um, to, communicate with the public and mm-hmm. and share information um, about the fisheries um, that we're managing. Um, and also I think, you know, that kind of um, ties back to potentially pressure from the public and constituents on um, the legislature and um, really just, just pushing for more kind of funding and resources and um the ability to um focus on that that local movement yeah so katie it it, it sounds like it, it it's a really great point it it sounds like does does do fisheries manage you know do fisheries management do they have a you know it it feels like a some kind of marketing role but it but it's almost kind of beyond that it's it's not you know other people will be kind of literally kind of marketing the fish and the, and the, and and throughout the kind of the you know the the sort of supply and distribution chain but it sounds as if there, there's something here about the 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 way in which fishery managers have a responsibility or an opportunity to kind of to connect um the industry to the community is that fair yeah definitely um I mean, I think, you know, any, any um, uh, elected official has a responsibility to the, their constituents and, and the public. So that's mm-hmm. ultimately going to drive policy. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, a, I think, a, a feedback loop of sorts. Yeah. And do, does... Do you see, or, or this is this is not um, uh, not not just to you, but to, to everyone? Is there is there evidence, or do you, do you see, you know, what what's kind of good practice in in this in this realm at the moment? Is there um, uh, is there more that that fishery managers could be doing um, around this, or or do, can you kind of point to a to a couple of examples of you know let's let's make sure that this kind of initiative that's going on, we'd want to see much more of that in a world like fortune and favor. What, what, what would examples be there? Uh, I'll weigh in here that this has actually already happened, but a few years ago, uh, California's legislature passed a bill that I think was called ocean to plate, um, something like that, uh, that really gave um, a board of health, a lot more latitude to permit uh, fishery markets, you know, direct marketing through through like a weekly market, for them to actually cut fish and fillet fish and provide filleted fish to the public, which is a huge step, you know, because many times the public doesn't don't know what to do with the whole fish. Yeah. And so, so that right now that's that exists right now. There's there's really very few entities that have taken advantage of that, of what that bill allows. But but that is there and is an example of of a legislative body being able to do something that was quite helpful. Great. That's really interesting, Steve. Thank you for sharing that.
Yep. Terrific. Any, any final thoughts on fortune and favor before we, uh, before we kind of move on? So, uh, just I think, to, I, I, definitely I, go ahead. I, yep. Yeah. As far as, <clears throat> and I don't know, you know, where this line kind of ends and begins between where like fishery managers are, I think are very different than uh, like how harbors are set up and how they're managed and how public accesses them, where people are aware, you know, we've spent a lot of years hiding actually where fish are unloaded and where consumers in coastal communities can actually access uh, fishing boats um, outside of recreation and pretty things to look at and restaurants, right? So I think there's a space that not necessarily maybe fisher ma- fishery managers, but yes. harbor districts and, and how we're setting up those uh, public access ways to fish that's being harvested and unloaded in one's communities. Right. So I, I do think that there's a public entity there that could um, learn more about opportunities to increase those opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a that's a really good point. And I know that, you know, I often think of Monterey being there as kind of a microcosm of of bigger things. And so um the commercial dock there, I know for me every every time I go out sampling, um, you know, it's a huge tourism community and so I at least three folks walking by every single time, you know. What are you doing? What's this? Where is this going? They're they're very interested in in the process. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think bringing in tourists into that conversation to help or yeah, you know, I, making them aware. That's right. I I I love that. And Travis, we might want to capture this. You know, um, the the point there. I think Stephanie. You know, we've spent we've spent many years kind of hiding. Um, the kind of you know the 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 landing and the kind of the the, the processing of fish and um, and and making that kind of more public and bringing it much more into the community is um is a is a really interesting point if we if we are going to see as you say much more interest in local um, much more interest in domestic much more kind of community based that that seems to be a kind of a a, a real um a real kind of natural opportunity there and I'll just I'll just weigh in one more time here um. Yeah. I made a comment, you know, USDA, they have like a, a, an app, you know, a whole marketing kind of arm of their hmm. department to help support some of, you know, the education and literacy around food systems, as yeah. well as financing, um, you know, capacity and technical assistance for farmers. So there's a space there that could be explored. Um, also, you know, just consumer seafood literacy, not really even knowing what species are right in season. I mean, it's pretty easy here in like Santa Cruz, Monterey, yeah. um, North Central California, right? Like everybody knows when strawberry season is or right. Like everybody knows when apple season is, you know, but nobody yeah. knows when halibut season is or nobody knows when, you know, like what, how, what is that connection to the public about knowing Hey, it's, you know, I mean, everybody knows about Dungeness Crab, but that's changing, right? And nobody knows why. You know, I get text messages that are like, hey, I'm lurking around the harbor. It's Christmas Eve. Where, what's going on? You know, and yeah. so kind of this just overarching like knowledge of what species are available and, and from where. And I think Sea Grant is a good partner with that. And they've tried to do some outreach and um, posters around that, but how do we, yeah. yeah, is there a space to have kind of this capacity building technical assistance, uh, support? Great. Yep. That's great. No, that's, um, that some, some really good points there. Thank you, um, for all of that. Let's, some um, t- time, time's moving on. Let's, uh, and as, as Travis gets the, the last notes down on that, um, let's move to, Let's move to Blue Revolution. And um, uh, Steve, I don't want to, d- depending on what you want to do here, uh, we'd love you to stay in this one. Um, it's, it's kind of your, your call whether you want to stay in this group or, or kind of move over to the community group 
Um, I don't know, uh, Chris. They may have enough people in there, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and keep Steve here. But uh, Steve, if if you if you were in conversations yesterday and you felt as if you needed to to kind of move over there, um, you know, we're, we're not gonna hold you back. It's completely up to you. But we'd love to love to have you stay with us. Your call. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to stay with you guys. Although you know, I am a, a community person yeah. Uh, yeah. From, from the you know the beginning and end. Uh, so many of my remarks here in your group, you know, would be more along the lines of what communities can do, what fishermen need to do in relation to their communities. So if you think that's fitting with your group, I'm happy to stay. Stephanie, Katie, Brianna, what do you reckon? I enjoy your presence, so yeah. I think uh, <laughs> your your yeah. input is definitely helpful. Yeah, yeah, I second that. Well, I have a thick skin. I don't. I've been rejected many times, so. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Good. I think it's good to mix up perspectives always. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And 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 Steve, please, um, you know, d d definitely just bring bring in whatever perspectives. These these are, you know, we, we talk about these being kind of different stakeholder groups, but but as as someone said yesterday, you know, the kind of we're 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 seeing this kind of the same themes emerging each of these, which is a kind of you know a heartening thing. So I, I think I think we'll be good to kind of mix up the perspectives here. So so the. Let's move on to, to Blue Revolution. So remember, now we're in a different scenario. Um, th this, this now, instead of a world where we see a lot of, let's say, kind of domestic, local demand, um, this is a world where there's a much, much more sort of commercial activity going on in the oceans, um, a lot more competition for ocean space. Um, uh, we talked yesterday about particularly fishery managers having the challenge here of um, operating in a very complicated environment with more workload, having to kind of broaden the amount of kind of agencies who are involved in crossover issues, whether that be wind farms, whether that be aquaculture and so on as well. Um, also some challenges here for range compression and, and, and managing around sanctuaries and things like that as well. So with, with all of that in mind, um, if we were going into a much more, um, competitive ocean space environment, you know, whether it be aquaculture, wind energy, other things, um, what's, what are fishery managers to, to do about this? What, what, what are some of the things that um, even now uh, management should be kind of paying attention to and saying, here's, here's, here's a change that we really, really need to, need to make if we're going to be operating in a much more, in, a, in an environment where we're, the, the, the fish and grounds and the ocean is going to be much more kind of competitive than it has done before. What's, what's, what's a, what's a group of fishery managers to do about that? We, we see it happening already in that um, advisory groups within the fishery management process are being formed to help act as a liaison or to interact with, these different groups that are um, starting to crop up and want, you know, to use the ocean spaces. So mm -hmm. to develop advisory groups that can interact with the other groups. Right. And are they, um, are they uh, already, are they, um, so is it the advisory groups that are already formed are kind of saying, okay, now we need to reach out to the following or are these, are these new groups being formed, Brianna? More that they're new groups in the right. process of being formed. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would jump in here and say that's exactly right. Uh, the Habitat Committee has been the primary sort of theater for <clears throat> aquaculture and wind projects, but it, it so quickly gets into other uh, user groups and, and uh, stakeholders and the science element, what have you, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, there is a pitch right now to the Pacific Council to create a, a single group that's more embracing of all these, all these other um, voices. Oh, interesting. So, Steve, as you say, at the moment, it, it, it seems to be kind of primarily the Habitat Committee being the being, let's say, the, the main one that that's looking for the 
the kind of connections and opportunities, but the, the Habitat Committee will have other things kind of going on. So it, it, it might be over time that this is a, this is a new, a new kind of group or, or, or um, yeah, a new group that needs to be formed around this. Yeah. And an example would be that, you know, there clearly there's habitat issues with, you know, the structure being, you know, found in ocean floor and, you know, cables and what have you. But, but also there are things like the, um, the ground fish stock assessments, you know, the historic trawl lines for that, um, you know, or could be right through the middle of these projects and upsetting those, um, those uh, the historical scientific basis would be a really big deal uh, for continuity of information. So, you know, you know, just one example of things where there's an obvious, you know, expansion of concern. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of information, you know, I'm thinking here is science research, um, will, will managers be, be looking for? In a world like Blue Revolution, so is, it, is it is it different from what they're what they're asking for today? Um, well, I I think the science would change in that some of the conversation that we had earlier about the fish aggregating um, and getting an echo, the fish aggregating effect from some of these. Uh, offshore platforms that might show up, or yeah, and and so we'd want to understand what what effect that is. So mm -hmm. that would be new science, but then also um, how it might affect just our long term surveys in general, and if they're encroaching on the space where we typically run our surveys. And I would add to that the the, the displaced effort uh, problem would really need need a scientific analysis because you know it's just very very likely that these <clears throat> these wind farms will um, you know exclude commercial fishing you know maybe not by regulation but by practicality with the cabling that they have in deep water. There's just, most gears are not going to be able to function among among those those gear those uh, cabling, and so you know where where will that effort go, and what will the impact be of that effort? So, you know, another example of what needs to be studied. Yep, there was um, uh, there was a lot of talk yesterday, and I've heard it previously about how in in a world like this, where we do find um, these kinds of challenges, Steve, as you've, you've exactly talked about here, this idea of much more um, kind of spatial planning and spatial information, is that, um, is that captured in what we've got here? Or is that, is that something that, that, that you'd say actually managers would need to, uh, I don't know, ask for more or request more or, 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 or um, I don't know, demand in some ways a different type of information. So how, do, how does this kind of concept of kind of spatial planning play in here? Well, if my opinion is, is that a, a competent marine spatial planning effort for the California coast would be a good thing. And when I say competent, I mean that the the right quote unquote, you know, people in agencies are at the table, and that it's not not a politicized process, um, and so that would be a benefit that that really hasn't been done yet on the West Coast here that I know of. I mean, some little pieces of it, uh, but I think it'd be a good thing. I think aggregating information as well, and and I think there's a lot of progress being made on that front, but still a lot of work to be done. Um, so there's a lot of independent research happening and a lot of information out there that, you know, maybe hasn't been utilized um, or, or paired with other information that could create an even more accurate story of what's happening. So um, I know that, you know, with Cal Coffee, there's a huge effort to kind of bring these various long-term data sets together 
Um, so the, I guess the synthesis side um, is becoming more and more important and really synthesizing um, all the information that's out there and you know not um, doubling up on on efforts. So. Right. And as as far as as far as kind of managers go or or within the within the council, things like the the scientific and statistical committee, I'm imagining would be, you know, very kind of heavily involved in that. That would be kind of front and center of some of their work. Um, I'm thinking a lot to uh, water quality. Right. If this is um, yeah. includes aquaculture and basically putting in new infrastructure that could harbor life or create habitat, how is that going to change in the water quality and what's happening in the ocean and, and this the wild species that are there? And as far as <clears throat> aquaculture, I think that's going to be pretty important as well as right like escapements and biological. Um, kind of exchange I you know I think there's a lot there um, right. for just the integrity of the environment yeah 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 how there's obviously a lot to study in in this one and, and we, we started we started yesterday uh thinking about you know the one of the biggest challenges in in for, for managers in in a world like blue revolution is just the just the kind of the the complexity of it or the kind of the 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 number of agencies that are involved in in issues um and then we've talked today about just the the type of new information that's that's going to be needed whether it be you know, whether it be as you say a kind of comprehensive spatial look whether it's about water quality whether it's about kind of aggregating information and so on um uh, what you know, is is this is this doable for a for a you know for fishery managers? Um, is can you can you imagine that that this kind of these kinds of demands are are attainable within the system, or what what what's you know how do, how does this get either prioritized or are there kind of changes in the system that are needed to deal with th these these new demands? Uh, Jonathan, I'm not sure this exactly answers your question, but I, I am thinking about um, another regional group on the Central Coast, the Alliance of Communities for Sustainable Fisheries. It's a it's a nonprofit, a 501c3, founded in 2000, particularly to address the Marine Life uh, Protection Act and and also the Monterey Sanctuaries uh, Management Plan Review that were beginning at that time. And it was the, the notion was to create a unified voice amongst the region. And so in the Alliance cases, it's six, six ports from Port San Luis uh, north to uh, Half Moon Bay. And, and now the, the focus of the, uh, of the Alliance, it really is this wind energy project, project and a few other things that have come up affecting most of the Central Coast, but, but the wind energy thing is a really big, big one. And, and they have created a unified voice uh, for that and provided comments to BOEM and and comments to state lands commission and, and so forth about, about that. And, you know, it's exactly the right thing they need to do. Um, and the mission statement of the Alliance is really kind of right on here that, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, connecting fishermen with their communities. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not management, <laughs> but it definitely, it definitely, you know, points to management. Yeah, no, it's uh, and it, it it it's so interesting, Steve. That 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 is, you know, that's emerging for a for a really kind of pri priority issue like wind energy, and um, and and we may see, I guess, we may see others. Um, there may be there may be others relating to aquaculture or others relating to kind of more information and so on as well. Um, how do how do others feel about this? This kind of almost like a, a broader question in a in a world where. Um, we're seeing things become much more complicated for managers. Um, there's new information that's needed. Um, the workload goes up. Um, 
is that something that can be uh, something that can be um, I don't know, accommodated within the within the current system, or do we need, um, as as Steve has suggested, you know, new avenues to to try and and, and new um, I don't know new organizations or new collaborations to try and deal with this? How how are how are folks feeling about it? Does the does the kind of current the current system work within a blue revolution world, or 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 do we need new new avenues? I don't know if this is um, a specific enough response for uh, what you might be looking for, Jonathan, but I think, you know, within government, particularly, um, I think a, taking on a bit more of an interdisciplinary approach to things, mm -hmm. I think, you know, historically, um, there's sometimes been an approach that everyone kind of works in their, in their little part of the world in their little bubble. And so really utilizing um, the ability to kind of cross agency support, even um, interagency kind of um, working with other groups. So, you know, I'm thinking like environmental permitting, um, you know, that in this scenario, there's gonna be a lot more overlap between commercial fishing and the environmental permitting group. So yeah, finding ways to um, communicate better across the aisle, whether it's interagency or across agencies. Yeah. And I know, um, at least for Central Coast, I think there's also some some established, like I think just abandoning the current system or current structure um, is not always a good idea either. So. Um, I know with the nuclear power plant on the central coast, there's there's already a lot of um, kind of relationships built around that energy source and um, yeah. environmental consulting firms that are working regularly to ensure that, um, you know, proper management of the nuclear power plant going on. So now that that's being phased out and kind of moving to uh, wind energy, I think there's a, a lot of those relationships are going to stay there, and a lot of that um, communication will and and regulatory framework will stay there too. So. Great. Yeah. No, it's. Um, uh, I think the. Uh, I think you, you you've kind of uh, you've raised a really really important point there, and and I I can't remember which which scenario there was some there was some talk yesterday about the you know the the dangers of siloed thinking. Um, whether it was in this one, I think you think it might have been in the conversation in the morning, um, but but trying to to get at this, how do you develop interdisciplinary approaches, and, and and what are the ways in which you do kind of make those make those new connections? I think is a is a really important part of this. Okay. Um, so, sorry, Jonathan. Brianna, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I was just looking at the beginning text where it says um, that this combines with decreasing stocks and yes. you know we're thinking 20 years from now um and you know i i just go back to that the environment fluctuates this is low variability right but that that won't be forever um yes. so with decreasing stocks obviously we would fisheries management would respond in a way to lower catch limits um, to make sure that it's reflective of the stock abundance, but you know, to maintain the interest of um, not losing the infrastructure, so that when the stocks do rebound, um, fishing can rebound with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really terrific point. Uh, a really important point, and I know in my in my time, you know, at the harbors. I saw, you know, squid, you know, come and go in great abundance and then, and then not be around at all for three or four years and then come back in huge biomass. And white sea bass also, you know, a more southern species that came sometimes in multi-years and then would be gone for years. Um, so I think, you know, the world climate change is probably a longer epic, <laughs> if you will, than, than those kind of changes. But I do agree that you've got to preserve the infrastructure somehow 
during these ups and downs. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, in some ways it might be, it might be a, a very good segue um, into, uh, into the, the next scenario, which, which preserving our infrastructure as we saw yesterday is, is, you know, one of the, one of the real main challenges of, of hollowed out. So it, it's good, Travis. Thanks for for putting that in the in the note there on uh, on Blue Revolution. But maybe it's time to 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 move across there and, and think about um, hollowed out. So just a just a reminder, Travis. If you can scroll back up to the top there, um, and let's just remind ourselves of the 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 question that we've got in front of us. So if we knew this particular scenario was going to be the future, what should fishery managers do now? Um, what should they consider doing? Um, so uh, this could be identifying actions to prepare for hollowed out, um, to ensure it happens, which is not the case here, or to kind of avoid it happening. So um, as we as we kind of scroll down into hollowed out, remember yesterday we talked about you know some of the biggest kind of challenges here, um, handling um, severely reduced fisheries. Um, obviously, this is a world of where where we are going to see. Uh, stock declines, as well as challenges to infrastructure from, you know, whether it be, you know, weather disasters and so on as well. Um, and there's a there's a challenge here for kind of, you know, keeping the fishing culture alive um, more generally. So if if we knew that that our future was was hollowed out or our future was in threat of being hollowed out, um, you know, this is a this is a really difficult scenario, and what what could or should management do about this? You know, in some ways, let's say the option isn't to do nothing, and therefore, you know, it's not a case of oh, we just need to walk away from this. If we don't walk away from it, then what do we do? What 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 will what will managers really have to um, think hard about doing? under such difficult circumstances or in preparation for such difficult circumstances what what what's 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 in our minds for this one i'll jump in to say that i think that the discussion we had about the need for flexibility and nimbleness being quickness of management is certainly going to be true of this and and really probably all the other ones as well we didn't add it to blue revolution but i think it belongs it belongs there as well. Mm -hmm. So that's um, again, and we talked we talked Steve about flexibility in permitting, flexibility in um, kind of uh, gear types and so on. So those 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 dimensions of flexibility still very much uh, still very much key in this one. Yeah, I think I think it's really needed in all well at least three of the scenarios. Uh, blocks of chocolates, maybe not so much, but. But uh, yeah, fortune in favor of Blue Revolution and Hollow It Out for sure would all really emphasize the need for flexibility and nimbleness. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, I think to follow up on that, as far as the gear types go, um, that would be to be prepared for more requests for experimental fishing permits to maybe explore different gear. Mm -hmm. And I also go back to what Travis said yesterday, which would be um, we'd end up with more fishery disaster relief funding. And so that means more time spent on um, overseeing that process. Yeah. And um, in here in the description, it speaks to something about uh, the tides rising and extreme storms. And that just goes back to, in part, the tsunami that we experienced. And I was looking at when it happened, and it was so long ago, but it feels like it was yesterday. Um, but just how that had an effect on the ports up and down the entire coast. Um, and so I think it's probably more of a community's perspective because it's more harbor-related 
and city related, but to be prepared um, so that you can respond faster, right? So that the ports don't sit in disrepair um, so that the fishing can, what fishing can happen can, can actually continue. Yeah. What, 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 um, what, what can we imagine being, you know, actions to take to, to prepare more effectively for fishery disaster relief? Is this, is this about like talking to, um, you know, is this about learning from authorities that are, that they are doing this all the time? Is there kind of, are there connections to FEMA? Are there, you know, there, what, what would it mean to kind of be better prepared here? I think somebody mentioned yesterday about um, working with and learning something from the agriculture industry. Hmm. Um, and I sometimes think about kind of everything that happens in the ocean is like a couple decades behind what happens on land. And so perhaps learning from the agricultural industry and, you know, either um, positives or negatives, um, and and using that to respond better huh. as well. I, I yeah. think also familiarizing um, ourselves with previous um, experiences with fisheries disaster relief. Um, so maybe reviewing what happened with salmon, reviewing what happened with Dungeness crab fisheries disaster relief programs. Um, you know, oftentimes in retrospect, um, we might be able to recognize how things could be done more efficiently the, the next time around. Yeah, I fully echo what Travis just said. Um, in particular, I mean, you learn, you do it once, so you learn from it and you can be more efficient just overall, but then on the other end, um, helping to get the payments out to the fishermen sooner and also on the part of the mitigation side of things where you know research and experiments have been set up um, to use some of the funding from the disaster relief and and helping that happen sooner rather than later because it's a multi-year process at this point so getting that timeline tighter would help overall yeah i think this is also largely the you know, needs to be focused on uh, the state fish and game or fish and wildlife agencies and also the Pacific States uh, group um, so that they don't reinvent the wheel every time that federal money is approved. Yeah. I just uh, wanted to jump in with the disaster relief. Um, the, to me, that's a, that's like, kind of an acute way of handling the situation. And I guess in this hollowed out, it feels like kind of a chronic, hmm. you know, symptom, right? And that, and and so how do we, I think that disaster relief being efficient and making sure we can support our communities and have subsidies available if need be, but how do we, support communities in the long term, right? If like if a specific fishery is just really not going to come back the way that it was, or and even if there is infrastructure there or if the fishery, the fish themselves come back, some fisheries can never recover from um market shocks and because those uh social and economic connections have been um, disintegrated by a lack of supply. So mm -hmm. what does that look like beyond disaster relief? Yeah. And to me, one of the main benefits of disaster relief is that it, it, it enables the infrastructure to be preserved. In other words, fish, individual fishermen and their businesses, their knowledge gets carried over because they can make it another year or two. Uh, you know, the process and what, and what have you who may be leasing space uh, you know, and have hoists and what have you, they have to maintain that, that they were able to stay in business also. Uh, and so I, I do agree with the comment that individual fisheries may, may not survive, but to me, the, the important point to be that is that the infrastructure somehow needs to survive. 
Yeah. So, um, Travis, so, um, let, let, Travis, let's let put the, that. Oh, I've got an echo coming in. Echo coming in. I, I jumped in because I just want to make sure there's right there's we're talking about two different kinds of infrastructure. I think this has come up yesterday also, right? You have the bricks and mortar infrastructure that helps us get fish from boat to plate in a non-perishable way. Yeah. And then we also have social and economic infrastructure and social relationships that foster those transactions. Um, so I think there's infrastructure can be broken down into two different things. And I think that, yeah, I mean, I definitely disaster relief, I think is helpful, but I think what does it look like beyond, you know, how do we just, is it realistic to provide disaster relief for several years in a row for several different fisheries? Mm -hmm. And if not, then how, what's the plan B? Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, in a scenario like this, as you say, it's it, the, the, the disasters are not, you know, kind of once every 20 years, they're, they're, they're coming in, year by year or, or or certainly much more frequently and there's there's only so much of the kind of the immediate as you say the acute response that you can um, you can put in place um and the 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 chronic situation you know has to be addressed in a different way and and steve to to, to your point i guess and and this is where i guess the kind of the the support of infrastructure has to move from just the kind of the support of the physical infrastructure into the into the the social and the cultural infrastructure of the of the communities is that is that fair stephanie to say that 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 that's that's part of the kind of almost the short term to the long term here it goes from the physical to the kind of social and cultural yeah i think so i think So, um, getting back to what I had said earlier about how the stocks are declining here and that the catch limits would reflect the lower abundance. Um, but I think in, in such, you know, where it says um, we have insurmountable challenges for many in the industry, um, that we would want to make sure we allow access to what can be fished, right? We would want to um, do everything we can. And I think that's probably a bullet too, to reduce the hurdles in the regulatory change and allow flexibility. Right. So. Yep, so that, 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 that last bullet point then kind of connected into the second one, yeah. I thought about this one, this scenario in particular a lot last night. Um, and I, I think one thing, I kind of have a question for you, Jonathan. So there's, in this scenario, it says that, um, you know, a, a few large companies might remain. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, you know, trying to pull positives out of this and, and find some sort of opportunity um, I'm wondering if it if the large fisheries no longer become kind of high volume, lucrative fisheries, if those larger companies will kind of abandon um, the industry entirely and potentially make room for some of the smaller scale fishing and yeah. kind of focus. Um, yeah. you know, management and the management side kind of give give opportunities for local communities to be the one to access those. And yeah. especially if if there's no longer a major export market, um, then that's that's really the time to kind of allow the local market to grow with what is left or what's available. Yeah, you know, it, it's a, it is. It's a great point. It's, it, it's almost like and, and back to back to this question of you know what are we um what are we what are we trying to you know preserve and protect here um ultimately um and if we are if it is about um preserving a culture and a, a and a kind of way of life then then saying if if things get so bad 
that the the more resilient stuff is is the is the smaller scale. Um, ultimately, it almost it, you're taking it a kind of a, a a point I think a little bit further than what was written in the scenarios. Um, but I think that's a, you know it's it's a very valid point to to kind of say you know, should we be you know should we be you know, supporting uh, those with deep pockets who are still around or is there a way of actually really trying to support and seeing a seeing a kind of a, a new industry develop from the from the kind of the, the the wreckage of the of the years that have gone gone through or something like that. It's it, it 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 it's an it's an interesting thought as to you know does does management um, almost look at this in a very very different way given the kind of change in industry industry structure. To me, the industry that would that would logically excuse me logically develop is land based uh, thin fish aquaculture. Hmm. And, you know, that won't make fishermen happy. <laughs> it won't address, you know, their culture and economics and what have you. But it, but in terms of feeding the nation, you know, the smaller scale fisheries and outlets and marketing, what have you, are, I mean, they're a good thing regionally for sure, but, but they're not going to feed the nation. And so I would see the, the really logical, um, you know, outcome being much larger land-based operations, you know, such as being proposed perhaps in the, in the Eureka, not Eureka, but um, well, that's Eureka. It's got that salmon project under works. Yeah. And so, and so then anything wild caught, Steve, just becomes a very, um, I don't know, very, very yes. niche kind of high end, almost yes. boutique market. Yes. But seafood, you know, per se is is uh, sustained by these other other ways. Hmm. We talked yesterday about how um, how one of the I don't know if it's one of the challenges or one of the opportunities here. I guess it's actually we put it down as an as an opportunity. The the issue that in in situations where the 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 whole of the food web is getting affected um trying to understand things from an from an ecosystem based viewpoint rather than a rather than a kind of species by species and managing in that way um th this this kind of in some ways devastating scenario might give um a a set of incentives to think about management from a from a very different way. Um, is is there anything is there anything we can we can say about that? We we kind of alluded to it a little bit yesterday when we identified ecosystem based management as a as as a as a kind of an opportunity here. Is, is there anything specific to say about? Oh yeah, you know, and under a under a hollowed out scenario, um, we'd have to approach management differently because. You know our our current way of thinking, almost you know species by species, just just kind of isn't going to cut it. Well, I think um, I think Diane Fleischner Steele referenced the carbon footprint of the fleet, the CPS fleet, mm -hmm. and that a study had been done on it. And I'm curious, does anyone know of a carbon footprint study done for all the fisheries and how we would change um, fishery management to reduce that. Thinking toward that ecosystem approach, not, I know you were speaking towards species ideas, mm -hmm. Jonathan, but even bigger and broader. Right. Yeah, I think generally the conclusion is that the high volume fisheries, whether it's ground fish, trawl, or CPS, they're the ones that have the best the best carbon per pound of protein ratios. And that individual boat fisher fisheries, uh, you know, unfortunately, really have the worst. Meaning small boat fisheries with you know very limited harvest. This is kind of a an, an outside broader note, but um, I think there's quite a bit of literature and push potentially at the national level for consumption 
taxes. And, um, you know, I would think under this scenario, that might be a um, something that would come to fruition. So um, that's a really good point, Brianna, because I think that that would definitely overlap. So something like a carbon tax or, right. um, you know, basically the the part of the industry that might be off-putting more carbon would be charged more um, and incentivized to reduce that footprint. Right. I'm just noticing uh, a, a correction I think needs to happen to the, the bullet that concludes with uh, large-scale aquaculture operations could still be supported. I think it's important to say large-scale land-based land -based. aquaculture. Because given the ocean conditions and what have you, uh, offshore stuff might not, might not survive. Yeah. And I, I would also say on the second bullet, um, where we have do everything in our power to reduce hurdles to regulatory change and allow flexibility and sort of to maximize sustainable take to um, you know, find what the opportunities are and, and to make those happen efficiently. It's hard not to think there's not a regulatory aspect to that uh, or legislative a aspect of that uh, because you know, so much in my observation, so much of what causes the long delays and long processes to make rule changes is fear of being sued or, or in fact being sued by whatever decisions get made. And, and there it could be that somehow, you know, correcting language to lessen the opportunity for, for you know, for conflicts like that it would be needed, but boy, that's a complicated, yeah. and complicated uh, uh, process. Okay, I'm. Uh, I don't want to lose, and, and Travis, you may want to put this in there. Just the the, the point I think that, that was made earlier in, a, in in such an extreme scenario like this, we may well see um, some. Uh, some other regulatory or, or kind of taxation issues coming in around around you know, kind of carbon taxes and consumption taxes. Um, it, it's probably something as you say bigger than, than than just the kind of the fishery management issues that we're dealing with, um, but it, it it could well be um, something that that ultimately affects the, the the viability of of different parts of the fleet in this one. Um, so uh, let's. Let's turn our attention just maybe for the last 10 minutes and then we'll give ourselves a break before we, we get back into the main room at, at 11. Uh, the, the box of chocolate scenario. Um, so so our, our final one, if you remember, we, we, in some ways, I think Jan made the point yesterday about how uh, this, the challenges and opportunities in this one seem to be a bit of an amalgam of, of all the others, whether it be um, that we're, you know, we're, we're still going to see rain shifts um there's going to be a lot more kind of complicated workload for fisheries management um you've got you know the kind of challenges of of keeping um basically just keeping things rolling under some kind of extreme uncertainty um so th there, was, there was a lot going on in box of chocolates not as not as dire a situation i, I don't think as as it is in hollowed out Lots and lots of surprises, lots and lots of uncertainty, certainly a huge amount of kind of need for flexibility, as we've seen in other places, um, and, and in some ways, you know, a big investment in, in technology and to, to, to really help uh, fisheries understand what's going on in, in such an unpredictable environment. So if we, if we knew box of chocolates was going to be the future, um, with a lot of surprises, and yet also, you know, a fair amount of opportunities. Um, what would management have to do differently? How, how, would we, how would we be preparing for box of chocolates right now? So I see, I see Carrie Pomeroy's on. Welcome, Carrie. 
Thank you. Surreptitiously. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Welcome. We're uh, we're uh, we're going through our sets of scenarios and th thinking about the different ways in which uh, fishery managers might have to prepare for each of these different conditions. So we're 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 rounding out our our conversation here. We've gone through three of them and just uh, just just ended up in, in this fourth one around box of chocolates. So um, welcome and feel free to uh, either listen in or, or or jump in with any thoughts as well. Well, to me, you know, the notion of new technology to better monitor is, is key uh, because, you know, what box of chocolates will bring to the scientific part of this is enormous uncertainty. And science really doesn't like uncertainty <laughs> and tends, you know, our science, at least in the Pacific Council process, tends to be, you know, very precautionary when faced with uncertainty. And so, you know, if technology can keep up with that and, and, and uh, mitigate that by, you know, more frequent, better and more accurate information, then maybe that uncertainty can be, can be mitigated. Yeah. So what, what, could, what could we do to um, encourage either more, uh, more development or more adaptation of, of of tech here what what what's what's within the kind of a fishery manager you know role or remit um that you're thinking hey yeah if if, if this is a world where we know the technology is going to become more important how do we get a how do we get a head start on that in the next few years you need money hmm. i would say this this one in particular, uh, for me, comes back to the interdisciplinary um, approach because I think it's it's one thing to kind of say, okay, we're going to be more flexible at the regulatory level, um, and you know, obviously, there's there's a whole slew of policy related approaches to um, doing that, but I think one big piece there is the digital infrastructure um and you know we started off yesterday talking about things that we were surprised by um or you know uh reflecting on the last 10 months yeah. and i will say that is one thing i am really pleasantly surprised by is you know there were processes in place that required either um you know snail mail or in person and I think there's been quite a few of those that have moved to a digital option. And even just that, something as simple as being able to, um, you know, submit something digitally or move the conversation digitally or, um, I mean, I, I definitely think there's value to doing things in person, but when you're coming down to being able to do a quick response mm -hmm. to a challenge, um, you know, being able to do that virtually is, is huge and really helpful. So in the interdisciplinary sense, kind of having the IT and the, the, um, digital mind in the, in the process and really kind of speeding yeah, yeah. up sharing information and getting policy through. So in some ways, yes. so in some ways, um, Stephanie it, uh, and Travis, you may you may want to capture this. So, kind of definitely a kind of reference to the to the interdisciplinary approach. And then what I, what I'm hearing there is this this sense in which let's take every opportunity we can to um, just see where we can where we can build in you know a a digital capability into something that at the moment has a you know either a you know, a, a kind of a, an analog paper trail or a, or a kind of, you know, a, a, a face to face kind of connection and really take advantage of the fact that, that, that the last year has forced us to do much more in a digital fashion. And that that's probably going to stand us in good stead for a world like Box of Chocolates. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow up on that. Um, in 
technology like electronic tickets or logbooks mm -hmm. gives us more real-time data and in doing so that's um that's reflected in our ability to track against a quota and and the management outcome from that would be to have less management uncertainty and to um set catch limits differently because you don't have to have such a huge pad for error um in that they might exceed the catch limit that you put in place yeah do you want to um capture that travis just in terms of uh uh, the kind of, you know, the example of kind of, you know, electronic tickets, logbooks, you know, providing real time information. And and minimizing management uncertainty yeah. for, for tracking. Or reducing, it's reducing management uncertainty. And also workload. I think it, it, there's just, um, you know, there's still quite a bit of paper pushing and mm -hmm. it really frees up. Um, room for managers to tackle bigger questions if you're not, um, you know, kind of kind of focused on the uh, the analog inertia. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Katie. I missed that last point. Just if um, we move to a more electronic platform and real-time information, it frees up workload for managers. Yeah. <clears throat> and Travis, Stephanie's also put a put a, a note in the in the the text box there that's. Um, you could you could kind of transfer across as well where she's she's mentioned how digital opportunities to connect and submit reports are kind of great for all scenarios um so that might be might be worth just putting into this one i, I i'm sorry the interdisciplinary digital approach this this bullet yeah. here no that 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 that's good i was i was referring more to um in the in the chat box and it, it might be something that because you're you have you may not have the chat open simply because you're dealing with the with the with the notes pages at the moment um, yeah. but there's that there's something if you if you were to open the chat up and there's a there's a comment from stephanie right at the bottom there and you could take the 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 first kind of, kind of couple of lines of that and i think that that probably makes a good a good bullet to uh, to include in this one as well You got it. Great. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that. We're we're coming up to um, uh, ten fifty. What are we? Ten fifty two. So uh, I want to give us a, a few minutes just to take a break before we get back into the main room where people join us again in the main room at at eleven. Just any any final thoughts here on um, actions? Now, obviously. One of the things that we're going to do this afternoon is to look across all of these actions in all of the scenarios and say, you know, what what's common, and we're 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 well on the way to some of those things. You know, we know we're going to need the kind of the the different sort of flexibility. We know that that, that we're we're thinking also about the the way in which we kind of connect in with 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 other agencies and so on. So there's there's plenty of things that we know we'll be kind of crossing over and think about as kind of key priorities um, for managers. Um, but before we leave this um, this conversation, is there anything else either on box of chocolates or any of the others you would say? You know, here's here's another. Here's another issue for us to um, to to put on the table, or here's another kind of set of actions that's going to be important for for managers to to um, to have on their agenda. Let's say. Okay. All right. Well, the last thing I will do is ask. I know I did the I did the kind of quick report out yesterday. As we go back into the room at eleven, um, would would someone like to just highlight maybe a couple of themes 
per scenario as we went through this. Um, Travis, you did a great job of kind of just just um, getting the getting the, um, the the screen sharing going with all the others yesterday. Um, would would someone be prepared to just speak a little bit to uh, to each of those? I think people are probably um, they don't need to hear my voice anymore, and it'd be great to get someone um, from this group to just highlight you know one or two themes as we go through each of these scenarios. Travis, I'm going to ask you: Would you would you be prepared to uh, just highlight a couple of things for us? Yes, yeah, sure. That would be great. All right. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone, for this. And 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 Steve, thank thank you particularly for uh, for for sticking with us and being part of this conversation. We really value it. Um, as we as we go through into this afternoon, you'll you'll see that there's a. Um, we're, we're going to have other conversations in our sort of harvester community managers groups. And because we've kind of taken you up for, uh, for, for this morning, uh, I think, you know, you're, you're part of the kind of community group as well. So if you want to kind of go back to that one for this afternoon, I think that makes all the sense in the world. Okay, I'll give that. Uh, I'll give that note to Steve. He may have uh, dropped off for a, for a moment or two. Okay, um, thanks everyone. It's it's ten fifty six. Let's um let's reconvene. Let's give ourselves five minutes. Let's reconvene. Um, well, in this room, people will be joining us back, and then we'll do just kind of half an hour of readout and um, and just sharing ideas before we then we wrap up at eleven thirty. So thanks very much for this, and um, we'll uh, we'll see you back. Uh, in this room in probably about four minutes time. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. Thank you. All right. I got four minutes. And then...
Okay, everyone, welcome back. We're at uh, we're at eleven o two, and it looks as if we've got the participants from each of the the groups have returned into the main room now. So, uh, thanks very much for uh, for doing that. I thought the the way in which we might go through this now is to um, you know yesterday we we ran through and kind of uh, shared screens. As we went through each of the scenarios, we, we probably only got about 20, 25 minutes um, to, to get, you know, kind of main messages across. So I think we'll just go, uh, we'll just go stakeholder group by stakeholder group and ask for maybe some of the highlights as you as you roll through each of the scenarios here. Um, uh, Travis, uh, you were part of the the group that we were in with uh, sort of thinking about fishery managers. So I wonder whether I can I can ask you first. Um, obviously, we covered a lot of ground here, but it might be worth just um, highlighting a few things that came up for for you and the group in the conversations that we had. So remember, for for everyone here, we're we're trying to focus here on the 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 question of what would it be important for fishery managers in this case to do now to prepare for each of these scenarios um, if and when they kind of played out. So Travis, over to you to, to maybe just highlight a few things that you felt were particularly important and, and, and just go through, start with fortune and favor and then go through each of, each of the scenarios on this. Sure, Jonathan, thank you. Um, so for the fortune and favor scenario, um, flexibility was a main theme. Um, we had this first bullet point um, to everything in our power as managers to reduce hurdles to regulatory change and to allow flexibility, um, provide flexible gear options um, or portfolio permits for multiple species. Um, another interesting point here was using fishing cultural history um, as a tool for promoting and ushering through fishing community sustainability plans um, and also uh, capacity building technical support. Um, educate the public on sustainable fishing, available species, seasons, where the ports are, uh, where you can buy fresh caught fish locally. Um, for the blue revolution scenario, um, an interesting uh, point that came up was form new advisory groups to interact with various ocean users. Uh, it was pointed out that the Habitat Committee um, at the Council kind of serves that role right now um, for a wide variety of ocean users. Um, Uh, understand that, that new structures on fergation. Uh, so these would be um, wind farms and, and aquaculture operations. Um, also, um, conduct new ana analyses on how these new structures will affect uh, fishing grounds and um, try to get, get at uh, that question of where will that fishing effort go? Um, the, you'll see that the flexibility, the topic of flexibility was also included here. Um, so same as above, providing flexible gear options and portfolio permits for multiple species and um, doing everything in management's power to reduce hurdles to regulatory change and, and also striving to allow flexibility. Um, for the hollowed out scenario, um, Again, uh, you see that theme of uh, providing flexibility. Um, also preparing for more requests for experimental gear um, or experimental fishery permits. Um, we also discussed disaster relief <clears throat> for this hollowed out scenario. Um, and we thought um, management could um, you know, review previous experiences with um, disaster relief um, to determine how things might be done more efficiently uh, the next time. Um, but also uh, recognizing that it's important um, to realize um, if and when a fishery is no longer viable. Um, you know, 
can't just provide disaster relief for eternity. Um, uh, also supporting small scale wild caught fishing, um, realizing that in depressed conditions, large scale operations will likely flee. Um, of course, uh, large scale land based aquaculture operations could still be supported. Uh, up to the box of chocolates scenario. Um, we talked a lot about technology, um, adopting new technologies for better monitoring, um, which can help address and mitigate um, the enormous uncertainty um, associated with this scenario. Uh, for example, uh, electronic fish tickets provide uh, real-time reporting and uh, reduce management uncertainty for stocks with quotas. Um, we also discussed an interdisciplinary approach to building digital capabilities for more real-time monitoring, reporting, and management. Um, um, for sure to focus on a lot of the other things that we've discussed. Um, okay. Great. Uh, Travis, th thanks very much for, uh, for for all of that. So, yeah, as um, uh, and thanks for, for picking up on the fact that there's there's a number of things that were that were raised in multiple scenarios here. It's something that we'll come back to um, a little bit later on this afternoon. Okay, um, so with that, let's um, let's turn to uh, Kit. I think you were you were in the group doing uh, the the actions for harvesters. So, any any thoughts? Um, Anyone uh, to just play out what what will be the what will be the actions that harvesters would be taking or would be recommending taking for, for to prepare for each of these scenarios over the youth? Um, sure, I'll do the kind of same spiel as Travis, and in fact, uh, I think there's a lot of similarities uh, with what uh, the managers came up with. Um, so um, that theme of flexibility certainly came up um, in our discussion of, of fortune and favor, and really it was a cross-cutting theme across all the scenarios, you know, starting with the idea of range shifts and how uh, you deal with new, uh, you know, new stocks appearing and, and other stocks maybe disappearing. Um, and there's kind of sort of uh, thrown out three options uh, for fishermen about how they would react that again, is kind of cross cutting uh, and uh, you know, either in identifying those new opportunities, moving to somewhere based on where the stocks are or, or exiting the fishery. Um, and uh, then, uh, there was a lot of discussion around uh, marketing and the changed environment and finding new and innovative ways to market uh, fish products um, and, you know, thinking about social media and all that st online opportunities. Um, and... Um, uh, let's see what else here. Um, maybe this, you know, is the best scenario for focusing on pushing for uh, improvements to infrastructure, which is a real need in Northern California that, uh, you know, being the most benign scenario that there's the greatest opportunity there. Um, and let's see, there was a long discussion about how how to bring in new entrants and mentoring young people and um, showing a, that the various viable career paths um, in the fishery, fishing and fishery world. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, again, all these ideas around flexibility and issues related to limited entry permits and so on and 
how to resolve those issues uh, that come with that. And um, also um, sort of recognize there'll be more inner jurisdictional issues with range shifts and we need to start thinking about that now and not wait. Uh, moving on to Blue Revolution, uh, I think one of the major ideas that came out here is, you know, fishermen maybe being open to combining uh, fishing, catching wild fish with also doing mariculture, aquaculture, and uh, maybe, uh, you know, Bob gave um, some uh, reflection on his experience working with fishermen in Japan where there's a lot of aquaculture and they have co-ops that um, but you know fishermen are doing both and that is facilitated through uh, local co-ops co so that might be an, um, an example or an, uh, inspiration um, and then just the importance of fishermen being uh, you know, interacting with, working with both uh, other ocean users and, be, you know, being active in the political policy environment that uh, uh, will be, is there for, um, you know, permitting other activities. And um, let's see, uh, so... I think, I, I guess the third theme that came out here was the recognition uh, that, and that sort of gets back to maybe some of the ideas around co-ops and so on, and, and the discussion yesterday around social capital, the idea that fishermen need to uh, work better together, I guess you could say, do some conflict re resolution in terms of different uh, sectors of the fishery and and be able to um, you know more unif have a unified approach to dealing with other ocean uses and so on and some of this you know a reflection that maybe we've lost some of uh, what our earlier our parents generation had in terms of social cohesiveness and so on um, in terms of uh, hollowed out, of course, this is the direst scenario. So, you know, sort of exiting the fishery is one response. I, if people who stay in the fishery will likely have to just generally um, contend with uh, less revenue, less income, and think about how to run their business in that environment in terms of not taking on a lot of debt and figuring out how to cut costs and so on. Um, and in that way, fishermen um, <clears throat> will need to, you know, uh, really uh, protect what they have and, um, and you know, uh, they're going to have to be vocal to, to pr protect what remains, what opportunities remain. Um, and uh, let's see what out, um, what else was there? Um, some of the same themes, I guess, you know, how to deal with uh, perm permitting and so on, and um, how to allocate permits that in a way that in a very constrained environment, you still can have uh, young people coming into the fishery as people age out and so on. Um, and uh, I guess just a recognition that as you, you know, the large vessel, more industrial fleets um, become more limited, they're kind of a, a linchpin a lot of, in a lot of cases for uh, supporting infrastructure and ports for fish fisheries and so thinking about how to deal with um, preserving whatever is remaining of the, the more industrial fleets and then finally uh, again this very similar to moving on to box of chocolates to what the manager discussion was about around 
technology. Maybe uh, one uh, difference here was, you know, the looking at the possibility of using ves fishing vessels, both recreational and commercial, as data gathering platforms and how to make that work. So a part of that would be innovation, technological innovation to make, uh, you know, sensing uh, technology more affordable. And uh, so it could be deployed, uh, you know, widely on, uh, on vessels. And um, just, uh, you know, probably, you know, integrating that with science and management so that so that the data can be effectively used and uh, managers can use that to respond more quickly in terms of assessment and management. And um, so uh, another aspect of that is the, you know, possible how to develop method methods for using anecdotal information that people on the water might have and integrating that in the science process. And then ge generally just how to, aside from the sort of um, fishing management side of things, probably there'll be a need for more uh, nimble marketing and how to make that work was the, another theme that came out. So I think I've covered it, most of the discussion. All right, thanks, Kit, for uh, for that. Uh, good to good to hear those thoughts, and as you say, lots of lots of overlap there between the managers and the and the harvesters. Let's turn to uh, Jessica or or Corey. Uh, Jessica, I think you were taking notes, so I'll 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 ask you to share your screen and uh, your yeah, and I can that. that'd be great. Yep, sounds good. So thanks. our conversation kind of for. Um, the fortune and favor really started around this idea of more social capital and organizations and kind of building a higher level support if that's at the Department of Commerce, but really starting with some local representation and engagement um, to kind of increase funding, whether that be, you know, allocating funds to help. Um, diversify portfolios in the fisheries or, you know, kind of using some of those SK funds to develop new fisheries or infusion for um, funds for people to work on habitat restoration, specifically with regards to salmon, which is so key. Um, and then it also kind of focused on a little bit more how interconnected and the flexibility needed um, between some of these major components. So we had a discussion kind of that not only does there need to be healthy fish stocks and habitat, but you know there needs to be flexibility for effective management and local stewardship. There needs to be flexibility in access, infrastructure, um, markets, and then to diversify those and support those. Um, so we kind of did this lovely list um, of how all of these things are really connected and that to support one, you have to support the others and consider the others during that um, thought process. And in addition, the idea, as others have mentioned, of just kind of like increasing data collection and and having robust data sets so that um, not only fishing communities, but managers can be more proactive in their responses and take advantage of future opportunities as they arise um, and just be more confident in some of those management decisions, allowing for um, more timely responses um, of like real-time data. And all of this is just to really increase kind of advantage of the local availability um, of different fisheries as they um, come in. So there were a couple of ideas on how that could happen and examples of where it's happened in the past um, that we discussed in a little bit more depth. Um, and the idea was just like everyone's mentioned to remain flexible um, and reduce some of these timelines for some of these actions to occur to allow access. Um, and one way that was thought of as a potential to investigate could be um, promote and allow more access to fish destined for human consumption within an FMP as a set aside type program. So exploring maybe some of those um, mechanisms to allow for more flexibility in management and um, fisheries taking opportunities as they arise of new and different species or different fisheries that are available. Uh, with regards to Blue Revolution, um, 
kind of similar themes as you can see the themes will kind of move through all of them as everyone else has kind of discussed of as new species are coming um, more available really that idea of technology and data and making sure we have the best knowledge available um, to not only meet uh, fisheries management and fishery um, and provide knowledge for fishermen to um, gain opportunities but also you know meet conservation goals as um, some of these sh shifts in range occur um, there's also this needed effort to engage fishery stakeholders and management um, in the process in a thoughtful and engaging way so as some of these newer opportunities become more prevalent in this scenario like offshore aquaculture and wind energy really involving um, not only the fishermen but the communities in the process as that moves forward and this kind of brought up a conversation that we had about potential diversification of uh, fishermen's businesses um, to kind of take advantage of other opportunities that would be provided through offshore energy and aquaculture whether that be maintenance or anything else and that could start now by building relationships between some of these investors in these new um, activities um, in the early process to kind of foster local community involvement and engagement. And so we had an example of where that's been happening. Um, and just ensuring that the community and the stakeholders are part of the regulatory processes as these um, new developments move forward and ensure representation. Um, for hollowed out, again, we were talking about, since this is the most dire, really the only thing we could think of to do was to build resiliency in any remaining fisheries that could function in this scenario um, to make sure that they're as strong as possible. And again, going back to all of those different components, making sure that the markets are there, the infrastructure are there so that these fisheries can still operate, even if they are kind of these boutique fisheries um, that the permits and whatever needs to happen to allow them to continue to function is available and really thinking that marketing is gonna be essential to make um, the most of this scenario because you have to be able to market what's available. Um, and like others mentioned, science and data collection become essential during this scenario um, to be able to identify any potential opportunities and mitigate any um, additional effects. Um, and the idea, again, of diversifying fishery portfolios um, for businesses, um, whether that be through um, permitting or financing uh, different permits, as well as diversifying ports. So again, pulling in that infrastructure component as well, as well as just the access to ports given this scenario. We talked a little bit about real-time data to notify of when conditions would be available to even enter these ports given some of the climate and ocean variability in this scenario. and. But lastly, we kind of discussed a little bit more on ensuring that there's equity um, and that the benefits from the small number of opportunities are distributed equally across um, communities. So kind of creating a pathway to engaging legislators and multiple alliances to promote the fishery and coastal community needs and promote some of these um, different aspects that would become to the forefront given this scenario. And lastly, kind of piggybacking on that, really engaging what you, what could happen now is to engage maybe potentially the new California state senator on fishery issues and create some established groups to promote and lobby for those um, just to get the, it up in the forefront so that these, fish, these fisheries are um, considered and part of the process. Um, lastly, for the box of chocolates, um, we kind of, again, went through the diversification of portfolios and what that would need to include, um, you know, whether that be choosing between different permits or market development infrastructure, and then just increase in information availability, similar to what everyone else said, that increase in technology and data will be critical in this scenario to allow um, opportunities to be taken advantage of, as well as meeting conservation goals. And the idea of real-time data technology will allow the managers to be more nimble in this <laughs> scenario. And, Part of that might be advancing some of the data limited models and technology through investment um, to increase the acceptance of new methods um, for interpreting some of these data sets. And then just really more collaboration um, between ports and fisheries and managers and NGOs and just kind of promoting the idea that collaboration now in these different groups um, to set aside funding and promote um, 
joint perspectives and goals moving forward. And that is what we have from the community standpoint. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for that. And thanks, thanks to, to everyone for, uh, for contributing to the communities and to, and to the other groups there. So we're, we're just coming up to our, to our break time. Uh, and usually in this kind of situation, I'll ask whether, you know, what are you seeing that's kind of common? We're going to be spending most of our time this afternoon um, thinking about that. Obviously, you've gone through scenario by scenario for now. Um, but what, I, what we'll be asking you to do um, this afternoon is almost put the scenarios kind of to the side and say, well, what, what, are, what are the overarching themes that we're hearing that, that, that seem to make sense no matter which scenario is playing out? Um, and so for each of the stakeholder groups, and we'll, we'll add in the science group as well, we'll be asking you this afternoon to really just kind of create an agenda for action. What, what is it that seems to make sense for us to really pr do right now? And what are the things we might want to put in our back pocket to make sure that we're prepared for if this particular eventuality plays out? So th there's a lot more kind of connection and pattern recognition to be done uh, later on uh, this afternoon when we get back together. Um, but maybe just for, for a couple of moments, is there anything that anyone in the groups today uh, wanted to mention because there the, there was an issue that kind of came up and you thought, oh, you know, this is a really interesting one. Um, maybe it got covered in, in the reports out from Travis, Kitt and, and Jessica, but maybe you want to kind of reiterate it just at this moment. So I'm, I'm not asking for, you know, what's kind of common. We'll come back to that. But I just wonder whether there was anything that people wanted to, anyone wanted to kind of add to all the reports out for now and say, yeah, let, let's make sure this one is, is shared with the full group. Anything for anyone to add right now? Okay, it looks like the, uh, our reporters did a, uh, did a fine job. So thank you very much for, uh, for doing that. So we're at, um, we're at 11.30 or just, j just before. Uh, let's let's break for now. Um, we'll come back at 2 p.m. for our for our last session. And as I say, at that point, we'll be we'll be looking at all the ideas that we've raised in these um, in these kind of uh, idea generation this morning, and then really starting to kind of prioritize and say, look, as as far as harvesters are concerned, these are the key issues. As far as um, as far as communities are concerned, these are the key issues. Um, and you can see it there. So we'll, we'll get back at two. Um, we'll be reviewing and then prioritizing some of those actions. Um, I'll ask Kit if, if it's okay with him, if he will send out the, the, um, the worksheets um, that we've created uh, over the morning. So you can have those at your disposal um, over the lunch break. And then as we go into those conversations this afternoon. Um, Kit, okay to do that? Uh, yeah, no problem. I'll get those out uh, shortly. Okay, that's great. Um, and so if there, I'm um, uh, just checking if there's anything else. Uh, Chris, anything from the logistics side of things for, for everyone to know for now? Yeah, if we could just have folks uh, make sure to log in a few minutes before we need to kick off so I can, I can't assign people to breakout rooms until they're back online. Okay, so th thanks for that. So if, uh, if everyone can, let's, let's try and log in by about 1.55 and then we'll try and be as, uh, as sharp as possible um, starting, starting back at two, and then uh, Chris will have a good idea as to who's there, and then we'll, we'll go into uh, some, some new group allocations then. All right, in the meantime, uh, thanks everyone for your work this morning, and we'll catch up with you just before 2 p.m., so in, uh, in, in two and a half hours time. All right, have a good break, and we'll see you this afternoon. Thank you.
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, it's just turned two o'clock. Uh, we'll give it two or three more minutes just to get the numbers up, and then we'll get going with the the afternoon session. Um, and uh, Chris, I think you're on the case there for uh, making sure that we're we're all squared away with groups and so on um, as people check back in. So uh, let me know if you need anything on that, and let's give it about three minutes, and then we'll get going. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Jonathan, thanks. Yeah, just a heads up. I think we're, as a, in the agenda, we did have, um, we're going to split out the science people and the fishery manager people, but we don't really have enough researchers, scientists in the, participating. So uh, I think we're going to stick with the groups we had this morning. There are a couple of uh, people, new folks that have joined. So you'll be assigned based on our best guess um, when we get to the breakout. So anyways. Great. Th thanks, Kate. And I think what we'll do is we'll we'll ask um, each of the groups, and maybe particularly the managers group, but but each of the groups should um, think maybe about the about the science questions um, as we go through this afternoon. I'll give a little more guidance on that in a couple of minutes. Thanks. Okay, everyone, we'll, uh, we'll make a start. Welcome back. So the, the purpose of this, this final session this afternoon is now, as, as you're you know, very much aware, we've spent the whole of our time thinking about the various different situations we might find ourselves in as, uh, as fishery community members over the course of the next 10 or 20 years. Um, whether that be something that is a little more comfortable, um, like fortune and favor, um, or something that is deeply uncomfortable, like hollowed out, or something in between with new developments like Blue Revolution or, or the uncertainty of Box of Chocolates. Um, and in each of those situations or each of those scenarios, we've asked ourselves, what would we do? What would be important for us to, to prepare to do to cope with any of those scenarios? Now, um, as, as we're all very much aware, we really don't know um, whether any of these particular scenarios are going to play out, which of them might play out, or maybe it's something different. And so the, the task that we've got in front of us this afternoon 
is really to say, well, given that we don't know exactly what's going to happen in future, um, what can we glean from what is it smart for us to do given that any of these could play out? And so the, the conversation this afternoon for the next hour or so is going to be back in our groups, and it's to look across the actions that we identified this morning across all four scenarios and just say, um, what is it that makes sense for us to do um, across a range of different scenarios? So even though we don't know which one of these is going to play out, it seems sensible for us to do the following because we're hearing it as something that might be relevant in two or three scenarios, or this seems to make sense across all the scenarios. And in, 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 in kind of terminology of scenario planning, we often call these kind of like robust options or um, no, no brainers or no regret strategies and so on. And that you may well have kind of heard those terms. So the primary thing that we want to do this afternoon is reflect on our conversations this morning in our groups, look across these scenarios and say, what does it make sense for us to do no matter what? Um, plays out. And that's going to give us a kind of sense of the priorities that might be in there for um, the groups that we're talking about, whether it be communities in general, whether it be managers, whether it be harvesters. Think about it as this afternoon really kind of creating an agenda for action. Um, as we get into the worksheets, you'll see not only are we asking this question about what, what actions might work across all scenarios, what's in common, uh, there's a couple of other prompts that might generate some interesting conversations just around um, are there actions that might kind of that we really want to do because it's going to prevent a worst case or are there actions that we want to do because it really is going to kind of build a flexibility to deal with um, any of the futures. And then there's also a question um, around, well, given these futures that we've identified, is there anything that we are doing now, whether it's managers or communities or, or, or harvesters, is there anything that we're doing now that we should stop doing because it makes no sense to continue this given everything that we've got kind of facing us in future? So there's a number of prompts that we can, uh, we can start to think about um, as we go into this kind of final, relatively kind of short conversation to say we're going to have about an hour um, to discuss this, and then we'll bring it back into um, one final kind of plenary conversation where we'll hear out the agendas of each of the groups, and then from there we'll have a kind of an open-ended conversation just around what 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 does this what does this mean for us? What do we want to take forward from this? And um, just just to kind of preface where we go with that, as I think I, I mentioned and Kit mentioned at the start, um, this is this is one of four workshops. Um, that we're doing on a regional basis and the output of this and the other workshops will then form a report to to council um, in march and then from there i think there'll be some con continued conversations about really kind of um, how do we take some of these ideas and these these suggestions forward um, in the in the weeks and months ahead so that's what we've got planned um, before i uh, before i hand it over to to Kit, see if there's anything, or or Chris, if you have um, questions at this stage as we as we start to go into breakouts. Um, let me see if there's any any questions about process right at this stage. Um, uh, if there is, feel free to ask anyone to ask now, and then otherwise, I'll hand it over to Chris to see whether he's got enough information to um, to press the button on the groups. So, first off, any any questions about process at this stage? Okay, Chris, do you have what you need? Uh, nearly there. So we have an individual who's calling in with the area code 831 ending in 219. I need to figure out who that is so that I can rename them. I will unmute them now. Yeah, Chris, it's Steve Scheiblauer. I, I couldn't uh, get online. He kept saying that the host had excluded me. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, Jonathan, would you? But anyway, uh, no, 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 I, that's not me. <laughs> Just okay, yeah, you know, the, Steve, that's probably the, the, that instance this morning where it had logged you in twice. Um, when we removed one of those to get the echo to go away, it must have blocked you entirely. Um, so thank you for 
calling in on telephone. I've got you renamed. Um, I, at this stage, I can get Steve uh, uh, moved over to the community group. Um, I do have to admit that I'm unclear if, if you're dialing in from telephone only, if it will move you properly, but we'll certainly get you up. Okay. And Jonathan, I did have a comment, a uh, yeah. question really about the process. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. It's, it's simply that we haven't talked at all about recreational fisheries and climate effects on that. Is there another process that's going to go on for that or wh wh where's that at? Um, you know, it's a, it, it's a great question. There, there is, there is no kind of official other process at this stage, um, Steve, for that. Um, it, it is one of these things that we, we could and probably should be prompting for at this stage. Um, you know, the one thing I will say is that uh, the even though we're doing these four workshops, I, I I honestly think that that the the value of what we've started here can be kind of taken more broadly um, and 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 thought about in other forums as well. Um, but but I you know the honest answer is that th there is no additional kind of process that's looking specifically at recreational fisheries at this stage. So if there are, if there are, if there are, are important kind of implications, then this, this will probably the pl be the place to kind of bring them up. And, um, and you know, it, it's probably, um, I should have kind of specified that I think yesterday as, as we're, and, and in our prompts maybe to think about that a little more. So it's a, it's a great question. And, um, you know, this is, this is definitely an opportunity to bring it up. Um, and we'll see whether there are other opportunities in the future. Thank you. I'm ready to go anytime you are, Jonathan. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Let's uh, let's do it, Chris. And let let's say um, let, let's let's give ourselves we're at two twelve now. Um, so in general, let let's say we have until three ten in these conversations. So I want to give it a kind of the best part of an hour. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll just assess where people are at this stage, but just let's assume we'll have an hour to, to discuss. All right, team. Uh, let's see what we've got. Um, I know that uh, Brianna, Katie, welcome back. Travis, welcome back. Um, Carrie, thanks for, uh, for for sticking with us on this. And Jan, you're you're back from from this morning. Thanks very much for that. And I know that Stephanie had to step away. So um, it it looks as if we've got a um, we've got some continuation from our. From our conversation this morning, which is great, and then uh, and then Jan, a continuation from our from our conversations uh, yesterday. So uh, good that uh, everyone's here. Uh, Travis, thanks again for the uh, all all the note taking and everything. And I think in uh, in the Google Drive, there's probably one more worksheet that I referenced earlier that um, we might want to bring up now and just uh, get uh, get that up on the screen and we can start the conversation from there. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. I think this is it. Yep, this is, uh, th this is the one. Um, so uh, maybe, the, maybe what we'll do uh, first off is just give people a, a chance to, uh, if, if you've been able to kind of see kits sent out over the lunch break, the the report out or the the notes that Travis provided uh, to us from this morning, and as we now think about that first question, which is probably going to take up most of our time, but we can we can think about the others as well. But that first question, what kind of seems to work across all or most of the scenarios, uh, it makes sense, I think, for us to maybe just take take a few minutes, two or three minutes, to look through the notes that. Uh, that it, that is in there. You'll see all the different groups are uh, their notes are in there. But let's let's just focus on the ones for fishery managers. Um, as you look across that, 
um, that'll help us then think about what is it that seems to be common um, across these uh, across these different scenarios. So uh, let's give ourselves a couple of minutes maybe to just uh, get access to that material and have a quick read of it and then we can discuss. Let me check if, if anyone, does anyone want to, uh, anyone have a problem either accessing that or any other um, questions before we just go silent for a couple of minutes reading it. And Jonathan, we're we're just working on uh, today's uh, consolidating today's um, uh, potential actions and not considering yesterday's. You know, it, it, in some ways, Janet, it's yeah. If if there are things that came up yesterday, then uh, then yes, by all means, we can look at those as well. So so they can they can certainly be things that we can um, we can also take a look at um, the 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 way in which it's designed but i know the kind of things will drop off in some ways we've we've designed this as being well yesterday's challenges and opportunities in some ways should have then influenced today's potential actions and so there there should be a link um between what happened yesterday and what happened this morning um but if the, if there were other things that kind of came up in the challenges and opportunities of yesterday then yes let let's let's make ourselves let's remind ourselves of those so yeah it, um it, it's not a case i'm not excluding what we did yesterday um i'm just hoping that some of the things that we did this morning probably reflected that as well okay so i'll be i'll be bouncing back and forth between yesterday's and today yes and just one other thing um i do you have a three to three thirty meeting that I cannot uh, reschedule? Okay. So I'll be dropping off. I'll 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 go silent basically. I won't okay. shut down my. Uh, I'll just go to a different computer and work on that one. But okay. I'll be back by three. I'll I'll be back a little bit after three thirty. Okay, no problem. Well, we'll we we should be through the bulk of our conversation here by three, and then um, we'll probably be taking a break before we before we uh, go through into the main room. So that 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 shouldn't be too much of an issue. Thanks, Jan. All right. Thanks. All right. So yeah, let's um let's take a look for for, for common issues, and uh, and then we'll we'll get our conversation going in a moment or two.
All right, let's get uh, let's get going. If you've had a chance to to take a look at those there, um, Travis, I know you've been uh, you're sharing your screen, so we've uh, we've been able to kind of see them from there. Um, that's great. So let's let's think about a, an agenda for action or kind of priority actions for for fishery managers. Um, uh, I know this one says fishery science. Don't worry; it's like we can we can kind of interchange between them. But um, fishery managers, priority action. So, if this is an agenda for action for fishery management, given uh, the the challenges of the next ten or twenty years, uh, thinking about an era of climate change, um, what what goes on this list? You know, what 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 are we seeing across all of these scenarios that? that just seems to be kind of recurring and common and it just feels like a no-brainer for us to have to put it on this list and 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 make sure that it's it's part of the kind of considerations for fishery management as they plan as they plan their their you know their 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 strategies over the course of the next few years. So what's what's on that list? I think we've said it multiple times and it's the one that kind of rises to the top, but providing more flexibility in management yeah. and in the regulatory framework yeah. and ultimately kind of making, making room for vessel operators and processors to diversify their portfolio in terms of gear and permit switching or processing mm -hmm. yeah so there's a there's a obviously the kind of the almost the, the headline here is a is a is one about flexibility and then the um the the in some ways that you the kind of second thing you said you said there um uh katie really around uh i like it kind of making room for you know, a kind of a, a uh, operators to diversify the portfolio. Um, okay, I can. Uh, but that kind of, uh, kind of odd, Travis. It looks as if the kind of the formatting is uh, is messing up, huh? Yes, yeah, so I will just, uh, I'll have to go back and forth and just transcribe. Uh, no problem. Okay. Um, so I think the, you no, know, so let's, um, let's put it in there as the, yeah. And then a flexibility in permitting. Great, thanks, thanks, Travis. So, um, where does where does this start? how How does this how does this get going? Um, is there a is there a kind of a natural on ramp to 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 kicking this off in terms of we we know you know we we've heard it from this group, we've heard it from other groups as well around you know, management, fishery management really needs to kind of do this. Is there a, is there an obvious kind of starting point to this? What, what's going to, what's going to start to make the difference? I think um, one of the things that we briefly talked about today, but also um, more extensively yesterday was in order to be flexible, you have to be much more predictive instead of reactive as, as a management, um, the management agencies. Um, so understanding that in all of these scenarios, there will be somewhat, if not greater, kind of northward movement and changes in, in ranges of um, target species. 
Mm -hmm. And um, so that um, management needs to uh, understand the connectivity and where those um, important um, habitats are um, in a northward um, extension so that you can anticipate and as well as model um, and that way you can be more predictive. And if you're more predictive, you can be much more flexible as a management agency in, in switching right. and permitting. How, um, is that, how do others feel about, about that? Does that, does that, Katie, Brianna, does that make, make sense to you what Jan's mentioning there? I, I would say that I, I think there's, you know, there's a predictive modeling component to that, um, but it's not everything in that, in that story. And I'm, I'm just thinking back to some of the management strategy evaluations um, that have been embarked upon. Um, and I think it's, it's important under any scenario to make sure that you have all constituents at the table and kind of running through kind of helping build the model in a way, right? Like I think if yeah. you hand over a predictive model that excludes say the, the fishermen from the, the conversation or kind of um, an understanding of what might happen um, that, that could end up in, in, um, a tougher place and and you know obviously models are only as as good as the data going into them so it also starts with with um, ensuring that we have accurate and um, robust monitoring data needed to do yeah. that that type of some, um, predictive planning yeah I mean, w w one thing that one thing that strikes me and this this might just be a terminology thing and i'm i'm I'm, you know, I, I've got a kind of slightly different understanding of this. So the, the, sometimes I react to kind of predictive because in, in, in some ways this, this whole scenario exercise has, I think, established and people have said time and time again that, that we're, we're moving into a world that is more unpredictable. Um, and, and, you know, particularly if we look at these scenarios on the right hand side, um, we're seeing a lot more surprises. We're seeing a lot more erratic um, kind of behaviors. So, and I, and I know that the, the kind of concept of predictive modeling, it, it feels to me as if there's, um, and, and this might, this might get to the, to the, the point here, Brianna, it, it's the, the, the word that springs to my mind here is instead of being predictive, instead of reactive, it's almost like being anticipatory. There's, there's, there's something about management that needs to somehow, um, somehow, uh, get into conversations amongst themselves and with fishermen and so on, where the, the point is we're trying to anticipate what's going on. And we do have, you know, good information, you know, and, and we are probably going to be expecting northward shifts, um, but there may be some other things as well. So predictive almost gives a precision to it. And I wonder whether just sort of almost using that kind of term of anticipatory might be, might be something that, that, that you know, kind of broadens it, and maybe just I don't know. I I, I react to I react to predictive a little bit, and, and and I don't know whether that's appropriate or not, or just a kind of terminology thing with me. Well, along with um, being able to be um, predictive, follows the flexibility, and flexibility to me at least implies adaptive management, and so. Yeah. It, it, it's not going to be, oh, we're going to predict this and, and yeah. we'll see whether or not we're right. You, you, yeah. have to, you have to keep adding data to the model in order to better refine it and to understand what is happening now yeah. and what that, data, uh, what that data means for the prediction for the model. Um, right. But it, it's not going to be, I, I certainly didn't intend that it was going to be, oh, yeah. it's going to be a one-stop shop. We know exactly yeah. what's happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, Jan, it's a, it's a really good point. And Travis, you may want to, um, you know, get kind of the, the, the concept of adaptive management, I think, is, is one that 
uh, is 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 one that, that 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 needs to kind of be played in here. And Jan, to, to your experience, or Brianna, Katie, your, yours is to what extent do you feel that it, a, adaptive management is is part of the the fishery management approach today? Is it is it um, is it you know? Is it yes? It's there. It just needs applied in a different way. Or is there a, is there adaptive management? It's it's just it's it's words on a page rather than really being applied at this stage. So does does adopting adaptive adaptive management mean something that will will it affect change in fisheries management? If we say yeah, we're really going to do adaptive management seriously. Well, I think I think at least in California it will. It, it, there there is a slow. Uh, there definitely is a slow uptake in understanding and implementing adaptive management. Um, from from my viewpoint, um, and case in point, um, you know, the, through going through the stakeholder process for looking at solutions to the recreational red abalone fishery. Um, it, that and working with the state on that, that process, um, it, it was kind of a surprise to me as one of the stake, kind of more of the stakeholders in the room rather than a management agency, um, uh, was that it was kind of a surprise that the, the um, management for take and restrictions was so slow, even though the, the department um, uh, biologists were saying for two to four years, hey, we have a problem. We have mussels dying, we have urchins expanding, we have um, uh, kelp forests being reduced, and yet we're still harvesting red abalone. And we know that this, all of these other signs are going to lead to a reduction in red abalone. And the management, whether it be the commission, Fish and Game Commission, or or other departments within um, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, I, I I think that it was just very slow in, in the uptake. And so I <laughs> there, there's a there's definitely a learning process going from the paper and kind of like the edict of. Uh, ecosystem-based management and adaptive management and trying to be flexible mm -hmm. to actually implementing it. And, and I think Cal Fish and Wildlife, as well as National Marine Fisheries Service, kind of learned our lesson with that, um, with that whole kind of, I wouldn't say debacle, but it just really kind of taken aback by how slow the, res the management response was. Right. So I'm just hoping that we learned our lessons from that. Yeah. So, what we, just just to help out, no, it's it, it, it's a it's a great example. So, just just to help us out, yeah, they go, Travis, you got it there. Kind of speed up uh, management responses. So, it, in some ways, it's taking it from you know what's what's in theory and what's on paper um, to 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 really um, applying adaptive management in a in a more, as you say, a more kind of timely and and and, and reactive fashion. Um, Okay, so so let, let's let's think about other things. So, okay, fishery management planning for the next twenty years. Um, we know we've got to deal with flexibility, whether that's in terms of gear options, whether it's in terms of encouraging, you know, a kind of a more diversified portfolio um, for 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 um, fishermen for multiple species. That's that's definitely one. Um, uh, encouraging. Um, a greater use of, of modeling, predictive modeling, um, ensuring that we're working with fishermen and kind of anticipating what's what's going on. Um, and when we have got these kind of plans in place, then the speeding up of management responses. All, all of those things are, are kind of are are good and and worthwhile doing to to prepare for the the, the futures that we've got in front of us. Um, what what else should be on a on a on a management agenda uh, when we're when we're thinking about uh, across these scenarios, I'm seeing this time and time again. Um, this just seems as if it's a really important thing for management to take account of or to start doing um, to prepare for these scenarios. What what else is on the list here?
think um, gathering information and data and monitoring in real time or improving um, how we obtain data and the technology behind that. Yeah. And that, I, I guess, kind of spans both the management, fisheries dependent data collection side, and then also the um, research side as well. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't we haven't talked too much. We've mentioned it about you know the the, the idea of of real time information and gathering data. What's what are the what are the options there? Um, if we're again, if we're thinking, yeah, we've we've got to get better at uh, gathering this information. We've got to um, use this data more effectively, improving the technology for doing so. Is there um, other examples we can draw on right now? Are there um, if if we if we wanted to put something in place in the next uh, you know, kind of months and years, where, where would where would you start on that? You know, what 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 do you think the what do you think the kind of almost the the best places to get this get this rolling would be? I know some of some of the other groups talked about is is this um you know are there are there collaborations with with fishermen and fishing vessels so that there's 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 somehow more incentive for you know data collection from uh, actual fishing vessels so there was there was there's things like that 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 I know you know we've spoken about or other groups have spoken about and i'm wondering if there's if there's anything else that kind of comes to mind or or anyone want to speak more to that regarding you know what 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 will it involve to kind of gather more information in, in data in real time what 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 change needs to be adopted i know for i know for um me my kind of my my central go to is a is a data por portal and there's lots of different versions, but one of my more favorite data portals is the CINCUS. It's the Central Northern, um, Northern California Ocean Observing System. And over the past few years, they, they, they started out really looking at oceanography parameters. So, you know, satellite imagery, um, uh, water column, uh, sea surface temperature, um, Pacific de decadal oscillation, um, uh, and so um, El Nino oscillations. Um, but in more recent years, they've also started incorporating harmful algal blooms, um, uh, fish and fisheries, um, e even birds and mammals. Um, and really trying to link biota to the oceanographic processes. Those types of data portals, to me, are very helpful with um, being able to predict um, and anticipate, maybe not long range, like multiple years, but at least months, if not uh, one year in, in advance. Um, yeah. So, and also the NOAA uh, climate, uh, I think it's called the Climate Data Center. There, that that um, uh, data portal is also very helpful in looking and forecasting um, precipitation, which is important to salmon, um, sea surface temperature, upwelling indices, and, and what have you. So um, looking at some of these more California current centric type of data portals and having um, researchers that answer to management really go in there. But, you know, it's, it's open to everybody. So, and I know uh, a few of the fishermen look at some of the CINCUS data portals for some of the uh, sea surface radar um, and for um, looking at weather as well as forecasting kind of um, uh, into into the into their season, so you know, really kind of 
starting to beef up the use of some of these data portals mm -hmm. um, and also beefing up um, what we want from those data portals. What do the fishermen want? What does management want from these data portals? They're there to serve us um, and they're happy to serve us. We just have to voice those needs. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so pay more attention to the fact that they are, they are out there and um, help them become more helpful to us by, 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 by kind of getting in, getting in those conversations around what it is that we really, that we're really looking for. Right. Right. It, it justifies the, the money that Noah puts into it as far as uh, uh, when, when, when state and, and federal management agencies, as well as other, you know, other stakeholders can use those data portals. Um, it, it, it helps when they go back to Congress and say, Hey, look, this is, this is what we, this is what we, um, what we supported. And that in turn, because Noah's part of the Department of Commerce, everything you know, revolves around um, socioeconomic um, advantages to having these data portals used and actually service uh, uh, fishing, fishing communities and, and management. Yep, thanks, Jan, for that. Um, Brianna, Katie, any any responses to that, or any other thoughts on the 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 information uh, and the, the the data angles on on what management should be thinking about in the years ahead? Yeah, I mean, on that note, I think that uh, it it was brought up a couple times um, something about experimental permits kind of becoming potentially um, uh, more common under a few of the scenarios. And I think that this in particular, kind of getting real-time data, um, experimental permits is a really good avenue to do that. Um, so to, to use a test case um, and see what works. And I think some of the challenges are that it's very fisheries specific um, what kind of information you're wanting to get on the water. And so it's hard to put this kind of blanket approach to collecting that data. So I see the use mm -hmm. of experimental permits. Um, and you know there, there's already some some new avenues or maybe more streamlined avenues for how to go about that. Right. So your the, the the point being that you think that it's going to be it's going to be easier to let's say make it take a management decision to grant an experimental permit if we have better um, better data better information about saying look we 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 need to we need to do something out of the ordinary here and we're going to do that based on good information so the kind of the almost the the um, the reality or the kind of prospect for experimental permits is going to be strengthened if we have better information. Right. And, and vice versa, the experimental permits could be a tool um, to get us to the best uh, information. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, sometimes um, maybe an approach doesn't work as well and being stuck with that approach for 20 years. Um, better to use an experimental permit, figure out what really might work, and then stick with that. Got it. Yep. Okay. Very good. Um, anything else? And, and so as we don't need to stay on this question, you can see the others there as well, uh, whether there are you know, we're, we're, we're talking here about the common question, but, but also are there, are there other things that we think fisheries management needs to be on their agenda for action because it, you know, it prevents a worst case situation. You know, we, we talked about hollowed out there are things that, that um, fishery managers really should be doing right now um, to make sure that we don't really fall into that. Or are there, is there anything else that kind of helps build flexibility to cope with the future? And there'll be probably some overlap there with, with the answers to the first one. Um, or, or sometimes, you know, it, it, it's very helpful to, to, to think, think about these things by, 
by asking that question, is there anything the fishery managers are doing right now or any kind of parts of the process that, that happened right now that given these scenarios, given the future, that we should stop doing. So th this is this is really just to open it up and to see whether anyone has responses to any of the any of the other questions there to kind of add to this list. Hey Jonathan, um, I've just been going through the notes from the earlier discussion and yeah. under um communities, they had the idea of to take advantage of local availability, potentially have a set aside to allow for opportunities to, to a broader group. And hmm. I think that's an interesting concept to explore. Yeah, say, say, say more about the set aside. Well, um, I mean, I take that to mean that if there's a quota or a seasonal catch limit in place, um, that part of that would be allocated to a, to a sector that would right. be named, um, you know, for local availability or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and D, so where... where uh, where should we add that that one in, Brianna? Is that under the kind of work across all scenarios, help build flexibility, or kind of prevent a worst case? Any any sense in which uh, we want to put that in anywhere particular? Mm, no, I don't <laughs> have a sense at this point. I think okay. it could go anywhere. Yeah, but the the the, the point being, and and I, I'll. I'll get you maybe to to just give some some words to to Travis to kind of re record her at the moment. But the the point being, I guess that what what you're looking for or what we're looking for here is um, that fishery managers are paying attention to the the needs of local uh, local fishing communities and, and and not just kind of applying a a, a broad set of rules that have been you know that that are in place for 20 years or so and it, it sounds as if you're you're looking for something here that 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 gives a little more um i don't know flexibility given local circumstances is that fair yeah i mean it goes in line with another bullet under communities that I, uh, it's probably under hollowed out, ensuring that there is equity, um, mm -hmm. the benefits from the small number of opportunities are ensuring that there is equity to ensure that the benefits from the small number of opportunities are distributed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's yeah. kind of helping to even things out a little bit. Yeah. Do, do you think, does this, does, does what you're suggesting there, does that um, require a, I think it requires a kind of change in the mission of, 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 of fishery managers or, or, or is, it, is it there in the mission already and it's just a case of kind of applying it? You know, is, is this something that, 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 you know, the council or, you know, kind of, certain groups will be will say yeah we we can definitely do that or are there are there other kind of hurdles or roadblocks in that way i think it would probably match current conditions but as things change um you might have to evolve to, to be able to address those changes mm -hmm. so you know it's how to think about the future And think about folks that might be blocked out um, because those opportunities weren't there when they signed up for stuff. Yeah. I think that's the, the really hard thing to reconcile is that, um, you know, we, we all kind of inherit in a way uh, a mindset and a regulatory, potentially a regulatory framework from a different era or a different time and 
Um, so it's, it, it's sometimes not as simple as saying, okay, we're, we're just going to be more flexible in reality. Um, the bigger challenge might be kind of untangling the past or like the, the investment and the effort that was put in, in the past. So, um, like, like an example might be an, an existing permit structure and someone who, you know, lawfully obtained that permit and um, spent years, you know, a huge financial burden invested in improving a specific gear, improving gear over the years. Um, and then, you know, is, is, it, is it fair, right, to have the capacity to kind of pull back from that and hand that over to someone else? Um, and, and how do you, how do you reconcile that in, um, an appropriate way? So I think that's, yeah. that's something that's really challenging at times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, um, let, 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 let's put that down as I, I love the, I love the language there. It's almost like the kind of the, the dilemma of untangling the past or something like that. I mean, so along those lines, um, the word portfolio has been used mm -hmm. a lot throughout these workshops. And yeah. it's kind of like, you know, how do you better understand that concept and build information around it so you can see if it's something that should be considered? Yeah. And how you'd actually work with it. Yeah. Are there um, uh, in 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 situations like that, and I, I I like that idea of kind of you know just just making the kind of concept of portfolio and portfolio management real. Um, are there again thinking about what what managers might do or what fishery management might do around that? I presume that could be I don't know adapting or adopting pilot programs to. To, to think about well how how would this kind of go about it 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 feels as if there's a there's something about fishery management that needs to get more experimental um and uh whether that's yeah thinking about in terms of portfolios thinking in terms of you know, whether it be de minimis permits thinking in terms of um you know some other elements of this there's there's an experimental nature to it that that I think a lot of this conversation is about that is, um, I don't know, somehow got to be both adopted and kind of communicated and explained to people who might be on the losing side of the changes that are going about. And I think on that note, kind of bringing in some non-traditional metrics Mm -hmm. Um, so on the social science side and on the economic side, um, so maybe some, some metrics that weren't included before, um, kind of bringing, bringing those in. So, so this is, um, in terms of thinking, okay, well, what's the, what's the return on, or what, what, what are the benefits of, of providing a, you know, a different approach, a different regulatory approach here, the benefits, as you say, just um, this might be that we're thinking much more about um, community benefits, about maintaining fishing communities, maintaining a fishing culture, in addition to just, okay, you know, uh, prices or, or fish over deck or things like that. Is that, is that, is that what you're, what the, is that the kind of the concept of, of different metrics? Right, exactly, or or even just beyond, you know, biomass um, mm -hmm. or quota. Yep. So, Travis, something in there about um, about uh, you know, kind of explore the use of different metrics.
Okay. Is there, um, I'm interested to see if there's, if there's anything that we could drop down to that last question there. So um, is there anything that you think the way in which fishery management goes about doing things, or we can also add kind of science and research to this as well, um, given any or all of these scenarios, what should we stop doing? What, 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 what should, what's going on at the moment that you think that, that just kind of shouldn't or couldn't continue um, because it's, it's not going to make sense under any of these scenarios? Is there anything that you can think of that, that um, you know, whether it be kind of approaches or mindsets or, or practices right now that you think that that's just not, that's not geared up for success as we're thinking about the next 5, 10, 20 years? Pink, you might be asking the wrong group. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that, um, yeah, that, that'd be, we'd get different answers from different people. But yeah, I understand it's a, it's a, it's a tough question um, to, to think about. And, uh, you know, just, just, just take it from the perspective of even if you, if you weren't kind of directly involved in managers, in management, as you, as you think about any of the other kind of stakeholder groups or scientists and so on, is there, what, what are you seeing within the system at the moment? Do you think, that just doesn't seem to make sense. I guess what, eh, I don't know if it would fit here, but um, what would be helpful would be to get stakeholders more on the same page so that mm -hmm. fisheries management can work towards the common goal of sustainable fisheries. And for everyone to, to get behind what that is, I think a lot of time and energy can be detracted um, because folks have a different agenda and don't agree with what, what that goal is. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the you know, the, I, I think that's, I think that's, that's exactly right. And this kind of this concept of kind of getting on the same page, thinking about the, about the, you know, the nature of collaboration. Um, Travis, if you can scroll back up there to the, yeah, to the, um, to the action. So I can imagine how, you know, sort of provision of information kind of would help around that. Um, the, you know, the kind of the, the use of different metrics, so there's a, there's an incentive to to think not only in terms of you know the, to to think of kind of more broadly about community. So there's there, there's some there's some things in this list that I think could could probably help uh, help us in that quest to kind of get stakeholders on the same page. It, is there anything else, um, Brianna, that springs to your mind? Uh, that you're thinking, okay, well, how do you get people together on this? You know, how, how do you start to um, align groups that might be, you know, might, might, might feel as if they're either in opposition or, or something like that at the moment, you know, and, and indeed, is that, is that the role of kind of fishery management to, um, to, to try and be the, the, the conveners of that? You know, do we do we do we have in this list at the moment the kind of the the ingredients for um, for a more collaborative approach, or or are there are there other are there other you know kind of ingredients or other or other actions that need to be taken? I mean, I think that that's really the how the process is set up now, right? Whether it's council or commission, and that you know, I mean, any 
any successful negotiation is a lose-lose compromise. So I think just going into it that, you know, not, not every constituent is going to get exactly what they want. Um, and I, I believe that that's how the, the process is currently set up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think one thing, this is just kind of like a general, just, you know, I guess more psychological or <laughs> kind of a general statement that I think um, incentives can can be far more beneficial than roadblocks, and that hmm. is sometimes a good way to get both parties uh, or multiple parties kind of moving in the same direction. Is to rather than than putting in roadblocks, kind of providing an alternate route and really getting creative with what that might look like. You know, that's kind of broad, right? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, the the th- this this yeah. It does feel as if it's there's a there's a kind of big challenge there in terms of um, you know incentivizing, kind of enhancing trust um, to kind of bring different stakeholders into 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 kind of more more of this process. And it it sounds as if also um, you know, the, the, this idea of kind of bringing stakeholders in, one of the things that we talked about a lot in, uh, let's say, uh, Blue Revolution was this idea that, you know, th- that we might find that there are new opportunities to align around goals when we see, you know, other new threats or other kind of competitors coming into the, you know, coming into the picture as it were. Um, And that, that might, um, that might be, you know, one of the ways in which you might see uh, new opportunities for collaboration or new opportunities for kind of relationship building between fishermen and fisheries management, fisheries management. If indeed there are now, you know, there, there are now kind of almost new threats to the environment. I can see how that could, that could, that could start to, um, maybe build a kind of more of a sense of common purpose. Okay. Any um, any other thoughts? Um, uh, Kit, thanks for the note there. I see that we've got and Brianna. Thanks. Um, we've got uh, the harvesters having wrapped up and sort of joining us back in. This is the uh, this is the group doing uh, doing kind of fishery management and some of the kind of the actions that work across all or most of our scenarios. So I think if we've got um, if we've got the the harvesters back in. Um, Chris, it might be worth just giving the community group a five minute warning here, and then we'll um, we'll get going in uh, let's say we'll we'll get going again at about three ten um, with with everyone in the room together. But let me just see if there's if there's anything else from our from our um, fishery management group that wants to add to the conversations that we've we'd ha- had up until now. Thanks Jonathan. I'm I'm good for now. All right. Okay. All right. Great everyone. So let's um let's just give ourselves a 5 minute break um and we'll see whether communities need that time when they kind of get back in. But let's uh, let's assume that we get going again in here at three ten um, when we when we hear out from each of the different groups here to think about okay what what might be some of the priority actions. All right, let's give ourselves five minutes and then we'll uh, we'll get going again. Thanks.
Okay, it looks as if we've got all our groups back together here. So uh, thanks very much for that. Um, Corey Writings, uh, with the, the community group, you guys uh, probably continued your conversations until a, until a moment ago. Uh, I just want to check with everyone. Uh, are we are we good to kind of get going now? Is it is it good to give people? Do you, do you want a, a five minute break and then maybe we can start again at three fifteen? Um, Corey, your call on that. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I think we're probably ready to just keep going. All right, let's do it. Okay. Um, all right. Um, well, thanks everyone for uh, for that. What I, what I wanted to do um, with the the conversation now this afternoon, as I said, is is in each of our groups we probably identified some kind of common or priority actions. I think that the best thing for us to do is to just um, hear from hear from each group in turn, and then from there we'll go into a more sort of general conversation um, as we're then thinking. Okay, we've been in harvesters, but we've heard what's going on in, in in community and and management, and then vice versa. So we can then just open it up and see what what really kind of rises to the top, and we see as kind of key key questions. And like like Steve did earlier, if there are things that are kind of emerging for people, and you think, well, you know, I'm not sure, I haven't heard too much about in this case recreational fisheries, and there might be an opportunity to bring bring some other points to the fore. Um, but let let's start as as Travis as we're in the main room and Travis you've got the you've got the um, uh, the the management and science priority actions up. I, I'll just I'll just make a couple of um, comments on on this one I think and then we can turn to the others. So unsurprisingly, I think the the main um, the main theme that emerged here on the on the management. Uh, fisheries management priority actions was the one that that loomed large across all of our scenarios was really around th this idea of how do we um, how do we kind of get flexibility whether it be in gear options whether it be in kind of portfolio permits and the idea I think that of 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 management encouraging um, you know, experimental permitting and, and the idea of just how, how to become a little more flexible and experimental, you know, using pilot programs is something that, that clearly seems to be key under, under any of these scenarios that are going to involve rain shifts or other things where um, the, almost the, 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 the current set of conditions are unlikely to hold. And therefore, we want to encourage a much more, um, a much more um, experimental approach to encourage that flexibility. So that, that that was probably one of the one of the biggest things that kind of, kind of came up. We also talked a lot about how um, more attention needs to be paid to uh, data for modeling purposes and other things. Uh, whether that be encouraging the greater collection of data, the use of data portals um, uh, in real time, and then also the way in which that data then gets applied and we're using it for decision making. So the kind of concept of adaptive management has been around um, for, for you know, many, many years. How do we um, as fishery managers apply adaptive management in a more timely fashion to kind of speed up some of those management responses um, seems as if it's it, it's very much a, a, a kind of key point um, there as well I think um, so in addition to experimental you know sort of being experimental speeding up management processes using more data I think the other factors which kind of came on a little bit further down this list were really around you know, is there a, is there a way for fisheries management to to think more broadly about the um, uh, the the importance of the needs of local fishing communities, ensuring kind of equity that limited in, uh, opportunities can be kind of enjoyed by by all all sectors. So there's there's something about the 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 way in which incentives are provided um, that need to really support and protect local communities. And then I think the final point that um, uh, the, the cursor is on there from, uh, from Travis is the need for fisheries management to kind of continue to engage more broadly with stakeholders, bring in more stakeholders into um, more of the, the management process. And of course, that kind of flows back into um, adaptive management as well. So um, 
and we we talked a lot about some of the kind of the, the specific um, ways in which some of those things might come about, and clearly there are steps to to, to go about that. But I think that they were the they were the main themes that we had sort of coming up here a lot around flexibility, the speed of management response, the importance of data um, for you know modeling, anticipation, prediction, um, and then engagement with with stakeholders. Um, Team, uh, let's have a look. Travis, Brianna, uh, Katie, Jan, anything else to add to, to what I've said there? Not for me. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. Thanks, Brianna. Let's, um, let's turn, uh, Jessica, Corey, let's, let's turn to communities. Um, and see what what came up for you for your your areas of sort of priority action as you looked across all of your scenarios. What what really did kind of bubble up to the top? And you'd say, well, you know, no matter which future plays out here, um, here's something that you know we think change needs to happen around the following areas. Uh, take it away. Yeah, so we kind of similar, a lot of it focused around that flexibility and nimbleness in all kind of groupings, whether that be in the fisheries or the management or infrastructure. Um, thinking a little bit more um, on specific actions, you know, maybe increasing some of council's flexibility for in-season man in season management processes, so like the timeliness of responses mm -hmm. and investigating what how other councils employ um, ways in which to increase some of this flexibility and nimbleness, whether that be, you know, a strategy like grouping MSY or um, other things in that in that kind of category. Um, also, really that idea of developing direct market strategies, both regionally and at the local level to increase awareness. Um, and part of that, too, is increasing collaboration. And one example would be collaboration among all of the Northern California ports, you know, really no matter what kind of sector you're in, forming these regional organizations centered around common interests um, to increase that collaboration and that voice. Um, similar investment in, uh, to the science and management group, that investment in robust real-time data sets and technology so that more management decisions can be informed um, with more certainty. And then kind of different ways in which potential actions to streamline permitting processes, whether that be, you know, through the federal exempted fishing gear permit process to make it more efficient, or, you know, whether that be exploring ways to allow for um, permit leasing and to allow other participants to kind of shift as shifting stocks do. So like allowing the permits to be a little bit more nimble and flexible in that arena. And then lastly, just kind of Again, increasing that political engagement to bring kind of fisheries topics to the forefront and coastal communities issues to the forefront so that um, funding can be um, allocated for meeting some of these goals and actions and helping them move forward. And sorry, Jonathan, did you want us to go through all of them? Yeah, what, yeah okay. why don't you do that? Yeah. All right. Um, we kind of, we also talked about when it came to um, actions that kind of prevent like that worst case situation. Um, again, if focusing on infrastructure and making sure that, you know, basic infrastructure is available so that fisheries can sustain, um, as well as, again, increasing stakeholder engagement um, and making sure that everyone is participating in, the pro in different processes as they move forward. Um, and then part of that too is not only that people and stakeholders are participating, but really, developing a new generation of leaders and participants um, that can think creative, creatively and um, kind of be that next generation that will include, you know, mentorship from others um, and increasing funding where appropriate and kind of an interesting one too with the shifting stocks we discussed a bit about like establishing a mechanism for that multi-jurisdictional management, um, both domestically mm -hmm. and internationally as things start, as species start moving. Um, the actions that we kind of came up with that um, enable a good future um, could be partnering again with um, what's been talked about previously, the ag community to learn techniques yes. for planning for unpredictability. Um, also, 
again, considering the roles in which fisheries play in a social context and consider how to switch and direct those social contexts to like more pro fisheries. So in some of the scenarios, um, you can see that things are moving more towards aquaculture or, you know, um, man-made meats. And so really making sure that um, promoting that social context of pro fisheries where possible, so sustainable fisheries and local products. Um, in addition, you know, that the council use this process in the future and come up with some actions to move forward from all of the great work that's gone into these workshops um, will really help ensure a good future outcome given any of these scenarios. Um, and then the idea that tourism should be used as a natural partner to preserve fisheries and coastal communities, given the amount of um, money that comes into these areas and communities um, via tourism. Um, and then the actions to help build flexibility to cope with the future is kind of everything <laughs> as listed above. Yeah. Um, and the the real main key themes are, are that diversification of fishery portfolios, you know, that includes also diversification of marketing um, and creativity and engaging. So really just making sure everything is um, as diversified as possible in all of those aspects. And then lastly, what should we stop doing given these scenarios? And our idea was, you know, it's kind of like stop the status quo and be able to reevaluate and improve upon the status quo, thinking about the potential um, future worlds in which we will be living in and planning for them accordingly or as best we can. And part of that is also stop cutting some science funding so that these data streams can be coming in to inform management and fisheries as um, different climate change scenarios occur, not only tracking them, but also then understanding the impacts of given trends on the fisheries and on coastal communities. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Great, great list. Uh, really appreciate you taking us through that. Uh, okay, let's go to let's let's wrap up with our with our harvester group and thinking about what their agenda for action is, and then we'll and then we'll bring it back together and 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 give people a chance to to, to chat about everything together. Okay, Kit. Okay, thanks. Uh, we had kind of a wide ranging discussion, uh, not necessarily uh, going with the trigger questions. Um, but anyways, okay. kind of a number of themes. Um, as we've been hearing about a lot, one of them was this, you know, around flexibility and specifically a lot of discussion around uh, flexibility and permitting. Permits are a big way of um, controlling participation in fisheries. Um, so a bunch of ideas sort of just generally trying to think of new ways of doing uh, permitting and you know, sort of moving away from the traditional idea of a um, limited entry permit that's controlled by an individual. And if there are other arrangements that might work for particular situations, while at the same time recognizing there'll be differences depending on the scale of a particular fishery and how ca capital intensive it is and so on. So. Um, you know, things like community-owned permits may be uh, appropriate for smaller scale fisheries um, and kicked around the idea of, you know, changing the whole um, idea of, of um, permit transferability that leads to the creation of a capital asset and impacts uh, entry into fisheries and sort of are there other ways of, of um, structuring permits uh, to, to address those uh, issues. And, and all of this in the context, recognizing variability in the environment and in the availability of the stocks and the need to be nimble. So um, uh, that's kind of where that discussion was centered on. And then talked a bit about marketing and just again, the recognition of looking for innovation and marketing um, and you know again uh, if you're trying to diversify consumer tastes and the possibility that uh, you know people will be landing a variety of different 
species and maybe in smaller quantities and how do you um, adapt marketing and the, the supply chain to those kinds of um, uh, conditions and uh, just generally uh, recognition that product quality would be an important component as well. It is today and will continue in the future. Um, let's see what else. I think uh, we did touch on the first, that one question about what not to do and pr pretty much circled back to the same idea around flexibility, I would say. Uh, talked about infrastructure, an important issue in Northern California, um, and recognizing that uh, maybe that's another area where you could think of it in terms of greater flexibility, even to the extent of, is it possible to have various kinds of fishery support facilities that are mobile in some way so that uh, they can be shifted around, you know, in response to conditions on in certain ports or whatever. Um, and maybe uh, also getting into the supply chain and the infrastructure related to that and uh, should, for example, maybe moving processing away from coastal communities as those uh, communities become the cost of living increase, they become more tourism dependent and so on. Um, and just generally uh, importance of man fishery management agencies uh, paying more attention to uh, coastal zone management, coastal planning, and how that impacts infrastructure and related to fisheries. Um, then we kind of wrapped up with a couple of final things. One was just uh, what is, what it asked each person what is what concerns you the most across all the scenarios and so a uh, loss of um the culture and history the community you could say of fishing um and by the same token that the general public maybe doesn't value uh fishing fishing communities and the ecosystem and um then um concern that the management process can't be won't be able to adapt and innovate um, and uh, that it needs to um, to come up with new approaches and kind of touching on the science component of uh, data provision and and leveraging uh, fishing vessels and fishermen as a data source and um, let's see what else uh, losing the industry entirely because uh, um, young new entrants young people can't get into fisheries and um, and then just generally um, I think sort of referencing ideas around um, creating um, marine reserve reserves and marine protected areas rather than sort of um, <clears throat> closing uh, specific areas to all uses, trying to look at the ecosystem more holistically and, you know, how can we uh, pr preserve and protect the uh, uh, ecosystem more holistically, you know, with some kind of multi-use framework. And then finally, because uh, we, visited the science question as part of our charge mm -hmm. a couple points were made just uh, scientists should be using um information about what look like abnormal conditions in the today to be able to understand and forecast what the future could be would be like and again this the whole idea of uh fishermen engaging in the science process through various um, cooperative and collaborative approaches. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay.
No, that's a, that's great. I appreciate it, Kit, for um, for the, the the themes that are emerging there. I think it's I think you've done a uh, a great job in both explaining them and and just pulling together. I think some of those kind of really high level themes that 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 are that have been kind of consistent throughout the the, the couple of days here. So, um, thanks to thanks to all the groups for for uh, working on that. And I, I think what more than anything else, what I wanted to do, do just with the, the the final conversation to have here is now, obviously, we, you've been predominantly over the course of the last couple of days working within um, one group of stakeholders, whether it be representing communities or representing harvesters, representing um, managers, kind of slash scientists. Um, uh, but hopefully you, you've kind of got a picture as well of what's going on in, in the other groups. I'd like to just open it up to see whether um, folks have questions or observations that maybe you're, you're seeing something coming up in, in one of the other groups that you're either, you know, kind of you think is notable, you're gratified by, you're, you're, you're surprised by, or you're intrigued by. Uh, so this is an opportunity for anyone who's, you know, just been listening into, you know, you've been part of one group, you've been listening into the others and the reports out from them. And maybe you just want to comment on something that's emerged in one of the other groups, or you want to ask a question of, of one of the other groups. Uh, so it's an opportunity just to maybe clarify some thoughts that might be coming up in one of the conversations that you want to, you know, hear a bit more about, or, or, also, or also, if you want to, you know, just offer some thoughts on, what you've um, both been part of and what you've been listening to as well. So uh, an opportunity for kind of cross stakeholder collaboration here. We talked a lot about it. This is, uh, this is us doing it in real time. So any, any thoughts or questions or observations from folks as we've, uh, as we've gone through all these lists. Anyone surprised by the um, the kind of overlap between the groups, or anyone want to comment on the uh, the the overlap or or otherwise? Um, Bob, yeah, what 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 are you thinking as you've as you've kind of been in one of the groups and then you've you've heard out from the others? Where, where's where's your mind in all of this at the moment? Well, I'll just speak up because no one else will. <laughs> and, uh, try to maybe incite some uh, some conversation here yeah but uh, this idea of flexibility is is really intriguing to me and i think it needs to really be thoughtfully uh crafted with some discussions throughout industry and council and agency and 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 you know really needs to be thought about when i think about flexibility in uh in fisheries and allocations and cross uh you know cross fisheries cross uh, sectors I, I I think of all of the work that's been done in the last ten to fifteen years to or twenty years even to uh to build build these boxes that everyone lives in and to protect their turf, so to speak. And allocations have been issued in those and they're and they've created, you know, there's been buybacks, there's been uh consolidations, there's been all of these things to size the fisheries to the available allocations. And when I think of flexibility, at least the way I think about it, it means we're gonna be moving fish around or fishery and fishermen around. And I think it's a I think obviously in 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 the context of the four scenarios that uh, that's gonna be a tool that we need to think about to to make this all work. However, we also need to think about as we stabilize one fishery by moving something, we may destabilize another fishery. And, you know, so that whole process needs to be really thoughtfully considered and banged around in and of itself before you go down the road. And I think it, that planning should be happening now. I mean, we hear, you know, it, it's a, a constant 
in the allocation scenario or schemes that, you know, some fisheries need more fish of this and less of that, and it's all allocation and it's always contentious. But, you know, as you shrink the pie to, uh, you know, in, in these scenarios, it becomes even more contentious. So there needs to be a really thoughtful process behind it. And, and then I think one of the solutions could be, and, uh, and then a lot of people be familiar with this term is, let's grow the pie. And so how do we grow the pie? And one of the thoughts I have is, you know, a large portion or a portion, I won't say a large portion, but a portion, depending on the fishery, is, uh, is not allocated various reasons all the way through the process due to uncertainty of what's being caught, what's being discarded, how valid is the data, how, you know, how certain it is. So one way of growing the pie would be to, uh, to actually get more certainty in all fisheries by having more accountability. And I know that's frightening to a lot of people, but um, it seems to pay dividends and if we grow the pie, maybe the flexibility part of it doesn't hurt as much. And so um, I think of it in those terms. I think that discussion really needs to be had. There have been movements to, you know, to add accountability to fisheries, add logbooks, elect, you know, and then electronic logbooks, electronic reporting, electronic monitoring. All of those things are valid, but it comes down to cost. So. I think we need to we need to really link those two and understand what's being what's being accessed, take advantage of the science that's being provided there to get us to pl flexibility. And I think a critical component will be growing that pie. Great, thank thanks, Bob. Uh, really appreciate the uh, kicking us off there with some uh, with some thoughts that that, as you say, kind of really focused on what what it means to deal with flexibility and how difficult that's that's going to be and uh, I was I was struck by a comment that that was made in the in the managers group where you know the, the, I think so, someone mentioned the, the point about how the the dilemma of kind of untangling the past in that uh, in that so much of kind of current decisions and current actions obviously have been kind of made within the within uh, a framework and a set of assumptions that that relay where we've been in the last 10 or 20 years and, and planning for that future we know in theory and in our minds that it needs flexibility um, but but making that change is is just kind of so difficult because we don't quite know the consequences of it um, so it's uh, it's it's good to good to hear you thinking about that and and good to hear you kind of come up with some some prospects for how that might be made more you know more appealing as well uh, Anyone want to want to react to to Bob's thoughts there, or uh, offer any other uh, insights into what you're seeing from from this? Uh, Ken, yes, yeah, your thoughts on this. Well, my first comment is that I am super super impressed at the things that both the community and the managers groups have come up with. Um, these are things that get discussed up here in Eureka. You know, we, you know, informally in different discussions, I hear this, the same kind of stuff come up at the college. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of a repetition of themes, that kind of thing. Hmm. I am baffled uh, how to go forward. Um, I, earlier I mentioned the Marine Life Management Act that got passed in California in 1998. It's 20 years later, the Marine Life Management Act, after having actually read it and, and read a really great book that John Ugaritz was kind enough to send me to, so I could educate myself about the process and the, and the, the legislation, uh, it's full of really, really innovative, um, kind of innovative direction, the same kind of things that I have seen today. And yet, in California, we're kind of stuck. And so I have limited experience with a council process, you know, one time to get a, a sardine amendment through. But I am confused as to how 
how this would get, how these ideas would actually move forward, you know, even with the support of groups like this. Thank you. Ken, thanks very much. Yeah, that, 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 um, sort of being baffled about what, what we do about it. That's a, that's a, something that'll, that'll, that'll stick with me from this. Um, uh, other thoughts? Yvonne, do you want to come in on this? Yes, I would like to, um, both to respond to Ken and to Bob. Um, so Bob, I uh, issued a challenge to Louis Zim during the Southern California workshop to send out uh, an email to his fellow council members and urge applicable people to, applicable council members to come to the Northern California workshop. So I don't know if he was the one who encouraged you, but um, thank you for coming because I think part of what can make this move forward is having council members participate in these workshops. And um, I would issue that same challenge to you to please ask the um, representatives from Oregon and Washington to attend their respective workshops. Um, you know, something we talked about in the last session in the communities group was uh, how do we not have, well, how do we ensure that there's some kind of process for the council to actually use some of the suggestions that come out of these workshops. We, um, not all of these suggestions are applicable to the councils. I think that's okay. Um, you know, some of them are things that would have to be implemented by the state or things that fishermen themselves would have to decide they wanted to do, but uh, it's gonna be important to share these ideas around. And I will say, since I'm on the ecosystem work group and, and um, you know, I think that we're gonna to try to get the ecosystem work group to think about how, how we can use some of these ideas and, and um, how we can sort of nudge the council into, into working on some projects coming out of this. Great, th th thanks Yvonne and, uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, very much we are, you know, we're committed to kind of going back almost immediately after each of these workshops with a, with, with a report to council so that they're reviewing that in March. But as Yvonne said, I think, I think then there's, there's a lot of the, the work to go from just what's written on paper to saying, let's, let's start to make some of these uh, happen and I think that'll 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 certainly be something the ecosystem working group and others will be looking at in the months ahead. Bob, you want to come back in? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I I just wanted to answer Yvonne. Yvonne, it never it never occurred to me not to attend this. <laughs> I, mean, I thought it was a, you know I thought it was a, a responsibility to do this. It's part of part of the job, and I I you know really appreciate being included and. In, being part of the discussions and um, yes, I think there are th the results of this, particularly now I see a little deeper into it, uh, need to be condensed and to the things that the council should address. And, you know, I think this is one issue that we've talked about this flexibility issue, but I think that should come from, you know, the, the, the work group and yeah, like I said, it never even occurred to me. And I know there are several, council members that I've spoken to in Oregon and Washington that will definitely be there. And, you know, I would suggest that you would make sure the invitation is front and center. And the only thing that prevents that is conflicts. And, you know, we have many, but um, once again, I, I really appreciate being part of it. Great. In in the spirit of so, Yvonne mentioned we're we're now uh, halfway through the 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 implications workshop. So we we've done Southern California, Northern California. We've got um, Oregon and Washington to to go in in this. Um, one thing that might help us is in in preparing for those two is has anyone got any any thoughts or reactions to 
you know, are you, are you surprised by anything that sort of hasn't emerged in this conversation? So Steve, you had mentioned earlier, we, we, we hadn't really pushed on the, on the recreational um, fishery side of this. So it's, it's a good reminder and we'll, we'll make sure that we, that we prompt for that in the next couple of workshops. But I'm wondering just, you know, both as a question to maybe help us in the next couple of workshops and just more generally to say, Hey, you know, with getting all of these people together and thinking about all of these scenarios, I'm surprised that the that the following issue didn't loom larger in our conversations. Does anyone want to um, offer a thought as to you know maybe something you expected to be front and center and didn't end up being? I'll be back on. You're going to regret inviting me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Uh, no, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little surprised and it's probably because where I come from and what I've done in my career and where I'm at, I realize this is a, a you know, San Francisco or a Northern California centric uh, type, yeah. you know, workshop, but I mentioned it before in a couple of the places that, you know, we need to concentrate what's going on on both ends in this, in this uh, movement of fish to the North and, you know, what is, what's happening in the South introduction of new species that we don't necessarily have in a management plan and managing those. We also need to understand the exit and how to prepare for that of fish that are in our, that may be going to Canada or even into Alaska and be, be part of those discussions as well. And it, it seems to me that that's one of those things that we need uh, in that if fisheries disappear with no ability to engage in the South, in the new fishery in, in new species that are there, if there are not new fisheries that fishermen down there can engage in for them to be viable, they will move into our area in Northern California and so and so and so on and so on. And so we, you know, risk impaction. We risk, you know, uh, um, we, we risk having more fishermen than fish in this area because some of them are coast side allocations. And I think that, uh, you know, all of those things are on the table, but it has to do with what's going on on each end. And it, it you know, those are not overnight discussions to come up with multinational agreements, treaties, whatever, with other countries for one. And for two, I don't know that we've ever had, well, we've had a little bit of, of uh, cross, you know, regional pollination in salmon and such like that. We've, we've you know, we, we work with the North Pacific Council and in and, and and, and that, but more generally in how do we do cross regional fisheries and, you know, what occurs to me is whiting is probably the top one. But, you know, um, if you look at if you look at yellow eye rockfish, yellow eye rockfish is, you know, uh, uh, out of overfished, but still rebuilding and constrains most of our fisheries. And in, you know, Washington and in, in uh, Canada and in Southeast Alaska, those are viable fisheries and they, they catch yellow eye rockfish. So, you know, as things move and change, we need to understand how that affects us. And I think uh, I, I'm a little, I, we didn't focus on that much here, but I think we should in that it affects us. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks, Bob, for that. Uh, Katie, do you want to come in on this question of what what's either surprised you or um, intrigued you that maybe didn't be, become part of the conversation um, more than we might have expected? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'd say surprise this didn't come up more. Um, and, and I think it did a little bit, but maybe just something that's become more apparent to me, particularly over the last year, is the role that the public and consumers in Northern 
California play um, because like ultimately everything we do kind of ends at the consumer or public sentiment. And I feel like a positive is generally there's a greater awareness about and appreciation for oceans and where our food comes from and also just services provided by the ocean to the public. Yeah. And in the context of this workshop, I think under any of these scenarios, you know, that interest and investment from the public um, can really help to be a part of the solution. So for the management side, it could be, um, you know, constituent interests coming through the legislature or increased resources and funding to the marine sector. And um, on the harvest harvester side, it could be stronger local markets or higher prices or a greater appreciation for commercial and recreational fishing and just greater involvement. Um, and then for communities, it boosts revenue and provides more opportunities for recreation or decreases supply chains, um, things like that. So yeah. I think in overall, just enhancing the perceived and real value of the ocean to the public in such a populous area as Northern California um, can really benefit all groups, harvesters, managers, and the community. Yeah. Th thanks, Katie. And, and, and I know that you, you may well have mentioned it, or certainly some, some folks mentioned it right at the start of our conversation yesterday, uh, when we were talking about what, what indeed we have learned over the past year. And I think, uh, I think that, that, that point came up uh, once or twice just around you know, kind of the, the way in which we've seen uh, consumers in Northern California really react and, and want to, to help uh, want to help the kind of the local coastal community and the lo local fishing community by by buying local, and I think more generally, it's it's a, it. You raise a really interesting point about how, um, as we think about today compared to ten years ago, and you know, without doubt, in five or ten years' time, there's just so much more transparency. There's just so much more information available um, about what is going on, whether it be going on in our fishing communities, going on in terms of um, the, the food we put on our plates and so on. And I think it's a, it's a really, really great point that, that we, shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that our, you know, our assumptions about kind of information and our assumptions about interest um, are the same today and they will be the same in 10 years as they are, you know, as they have been in the past. So uh, it's, it's a really great point. Thanks for sharing that. Um, any other any other reactions uh, to this, Brianna? Yes, when you come in. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, going back to some of the ideas from before about folks or stakeholders understanding and being on the same page as to what sustainable fisheries management is, and and really trying to maintain progress towards that goal and thinking about what sort of time detractions can happen um, or kind of get in the way of progress and add workload. And um, some of that would be to kind of stop management by the courts or having the courts interject in fisheries management. Um, just a thought to throw out there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Let me let me check before we uh, we'll, we'll we'll wrap up in a in a in a few minutes here. But uh, let me see if Kit or Chris is there anything we've been we've been live stream live streaming this to to uh, see if anyone wants to uh, connect in from from the public. Is there anything, Kit, Chris, um, that comments have come in from the from the comment box on the on the live stream? No, no comments. All right. Okay. Um, so I think we've we've covered off really what we what we wanted to do. You've given us 
you know, w- w- without doubt, we've seen the the worksheets and we've got that material, and you've given us a, a tremendous amount of information on which to kind of build the the, the kind of next part of this. So, as I said uh, yesterday, we had a very successful workshop with Southern California. We've done the same now with North, Northern California. Um, we've got some you know slightly different themes emerging this time compared to last time. Um, but there's a lot of overlap as well. And then uh, we've got Washington coming up uh, in a week's time and then Oregon um, at the start of February. So by the time we've, we've gone through all of those, I think we'll have a, you know, a very, very rich kind of sense in which here's, here are the, the, the themes and the really important things that, um, that whether it be managers or you know, fishing communities, coastal communities, harvesters, really have on their minds and they're thinking about as they're preparing for for the future and um and and i think to 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 ken to, to your point i think that the task then is to go from you know having these ideas and then saying okay let's 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 try and get away from our bafflement as to what we do about this and we move to what yvonne was saying regarding you know here's here's the kind of few things that we're really going to take forward because we think it's so important um the other thing i'll mention is that uh the 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 way in which we've kind of gone about this using these scenarios obviously we've got a kind of formal process about these these workshops and then that'll go into like a, a report to council and then we'll 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 think about what the what the next stages are there um i would also encourage anyone here to use these kinds of scenarios as ways to just generate conversations about what could be you know, in, in in place for the future, um, you'll see that you know part of what we've been doing in the run up to this is creating you know whether it be the long reports or the much more accessible you know, sets of videos. And so, if if there are opportunities to to bring groups together, uh, kind of COVID permitted or even online in the next few months, um, then please by all means use the the ideas that have come out of this or the the scenarios themselves as ways of kind of prompting discussion about what's what could be possible and indeed what could be challenging in the future so i'm hoping that 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 you've seen the value of this and then you know this process will continue but you know please feel free that if there is value in the way in which we've approached this and you can see this being connected into other things that you're doing please feel free to use um, any of this any of these materials in uh, in other ways just just let us know about that all right um i'm i'm going to see whether there are any kind of final thoughts from folks any any questions about process or any kind of final um uh themes to mention uh, at this stage as i say you know we we're, we're really taking this forward and uh, and this is really tremendous input for uh, for for council and, and and other things as we um as we go through the next kind of weeks and months so if there if there is nothing else for now um kit maybe i'll hand over to you just to uh sign off and you know maybe uh, either kind of echo or uh inform uh, folks of anything else is kind of coming up over the next weeks and months. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, Jonathan, as always, for uh, leading us through the workshop. And uh, thanks to all the participants for taking all this time over the last couple of days to participate. Um, and uh, as Jonathan said, I think we'll be pulling together this information and it will be a real benefit to the council and they're thinking about how to deal with uh, the climate change and how they manage fisheries and so on. So um, I don't have anything else besides that. Jonathan covered it. it uh, we have a couple more workshops to go. Um, they are All these workshops are being live streamed through our website. So if you haven't had gotten enough, you can have the opportunity to uh, tune into those workshops and, and listen to what people are saying in the other uh, regions. So that's all I have. And thanks again. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.
Thank you.